The employment data is really important. The Fed gets it. They understand that employment risks are actually going up. I don't think that the economy is going to do as well as the market is pricing in. I think it's getting a little bit over its skis. There is an excitement about rate cuts and the opportunities that they bring. But there's also this trepidation that what if that 50 basis point cut was a crisis cut? All the data from now until November are going to decide whether the Fed goes 50 or 25. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Ferro, Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. Let's get your week started. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. Bloomberg Surveillance starts right now. And here are your scores on the S&P 500. Slightly negative on the S&P. Just off all-time highs after a third week of gains on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq 100, we're down a single tenth of 1%. A bit of underperformance on the Russell. On the small caps, we're down four tenths. Lots to talk about over in China. We'll get to that in a moment. I want to talk about the week ahead. Two standout issues for the week ahead. One is on Friday. Payrolls one is later this afternoon, Bramo. Chairman Powell speaks. 1.55 p.m. at the NAB conference. How much does this really set the tone for the rest of the week in terms of understanding how high the threshold is to have another outsized cut? In other words, is there a sort of a downside surprise that needs to take place or is there a consensus building on this committee that they can have room to cut pretty aggressively even without any weakness just simply because the neutral rate is substantially lower? Torsten Slock over the weekend saying summing up how he views the economy now. Current economic conditions can be best described as Goldilocks. Not too hot, not too cold. But the story doesn't end here. The risk with cutting interest rates too much too quickly that the economy becomes too hot again. And you mentioned China. We had a deflationary China. Well, we now have an inflationary one. Well, let's talk about the data we get this week first. Payrolls on Friday, 146K is the estimate in our survey. The previous read, 142. Jobless claims on Thursday, we're looking for 221. Last week, 218. If you look at the U.S. economic data right now in the jobs market, things are still OK at a very high level. Which is the reason why it's this Goldilocks moment. And what struck me over the weekend is we have bifurcated tales that are becoming more and more bifurcated and people are doubling down on this Goldilocks landing. Mike Wilson of Morgan Stanley saying that over the next three to six months, equity performance, uh, both at the equity and sector level, will be determined more by labor market data than anything else. So which is mispr mispriced? Which is most mispriced? Is it the idea of an accelerating uh, economy, or is it one that is much weaker uh, than possible? And which is it, the sort of Torst and Slock view of the world, or the Andrew Hall and Horst view of the world? Well, if you're looking at one economy specifically this morning, it's the risk of reacceleration. It's China. The CSI 300 absolutely ripping in today's session, higher by more than eight percent, a nine day winning streak on a CSI 300, higher over that period by almost 30 full percentage points. This market is absolutely ripped and Lisa, seemingly nobody wants to be short going into week long holidays over in China. What's fascinating to me is that everyone believes that this is a bazooka. And what's fascinating to me is that not only are people betting on Chinese equities, but this is sort of the rationale for what's underpinning this broadening out. That has been one of the biggest broadening outs that we've seen in quite a while. And I'm not just talking about within China. I'm talking about within Europe. I'm talking about within a, a bunch of different sectors in the U.S. How else does it make sense that the euro is stronger today after some pretty negative data coming out of Germany and the auto manufacturers unless, well, China is stimulating? Why will the read through be so significant to the rest of the world if we haven't even gathered how much this is really is going to help the Chinese economy and really stimulate the Chinese consumer? It also comes when we got fresh data out of China. When you look at what's going on in the real economy, the manufacturer data, the factory orders, they are still slumping. It just shows how needed that stimulus was. But how effective is the big question that stimulus is going to be? We've had false dawns before when it comes to the Chinese economy. And I think that's a big question right now. But to your point, Lisa, it is a huge sign of relief not just for stocks, but also commodities like iron ore and then desperately needed for the European economy. So I think this is a big challenge for investors right now and has been over the last week or so with regards to China. Can you get excited about the future when there are so many reasons to be anxious about the present. I think the European automakers are a fantastic example of that. Look at what we saw from BMW, Mercedes, VW last week. Those stocks absolutely ripped. And then it's the Monday morning reality check from Volkswagen, from Stellantis. Stellantis kind of gets outlook. VW, the second profit warning 
in three months. The problem is it's hard to see how to fix this, right? I mean, you could say, okay, stimulate China and then you'll get more demand. But are you really going to get more demand for European auto manufacturers when you're talking about a price disadvantage and such a competitive landscape? It sort of raises the question, how much is this a domestic story and how much is this an international story? And that's something that structurally people are trying to get their hands around at a time where there are national champions in China and in Germany, what are they, right? They are struggling and they have overcapacity and they don't have profits to show for it. They're struggling big time. And the issue is right now, and this line they are walking, and I spoke to the German foreign minister about this Friday evening, Annalena Burback, what are you going to do? She said, well, we sharpened our tone on China. Well, you sharpened your tone. Are you going to sharpen your actions? Friday, we will get a decision out of the European Union when it comes to tariffs at a time when China is stimulating and they should be leaning into selling more cars. Potentially, we can buy more, but they're potentially going to have to raise the walls because why? They are concerned about this overcapacity. Well, it's not just a reality check for the automakers. It's also a reality check for the German officials like the foreign minister you spoke to on Friday. Germany essentially abandoning or at least poised to abandon any hope for growth in 2024. What about 2025? When we think about the European automakers, and I'm pleased you brought up the national champions in China, not just in Europe, this is going to boost stimulus for what? Purchases of cars? Maybe. Whose cars? BYD, NIO, or the likes of Volkswagen and Stellantis trying to sell into the Chinese economy because the trend of the last year has been to shift towards national champions. There's a preference of Chinese consumers to buy domestic brands. Will it really lift all boats in quite the same way? This is exactly the question that I think is preeminent on a morning like this. All of a sudden, rising tide lifts all boats or does it, right? And this is sort of this feeling that people have been waiting for that stimulus from China to potentially offer uh, that stimulative boost to the rest of the economy that once China provided but as the structure of the economic channels change to such a degree that that boost in China isn't going to really spill over certainly as much to Europe. U.S. is more immune to that, right? That has its own stimulus and its own kind of issues. But to me, that's really the ultimate question with Europe at a time when the euro is the strongest versus the dollar going back to July of 2023. On what? Euro dollar, 112. More on the euro a little bit later. The biggest one day gain since 2008 on a CSI 300 over in China after the biggest one week gain since 2008 just last week. Speaking of risks, the dominant risk this week, the threat of port strikes in America across the East Coast and around to the Gulf Coast. That is a real risk this week. Well, what I was talking to officials about, what are you so concerned about leading up to the election? This was one of the biggest issues for two reasons. How do you come out and talk about it? With the White House right now, what they're saying is that they are going to leave it up to the negotiating table. At the moment, they do not want to get involved, but they want to see everyone go to the negotiating table. But at the same time, you do not want to see an increase in inflation, which potentially a prolonged port strike could reaccelerate inflation and also upset a number of consumers. This is a port strike from Maine to Texas. It is a cloud hanging over this administration and the incumbent candidate, Kamala Harris. Yes, yeah, so people are calling this the biggest wild card heading into uh, November, given the fact that a strike like this could cost the U.S. economy four and a half billion to seven and a half billion dollars a week. This, according to Oxford Economics, bigger issue to me is longer term effects, because you could get that back if you open the ports and some of those uh, supplies start coming through. Think about retailers that have been struggling with all of the inventory booms and busts post pandemic. How do you plan? For suddenly your equipment, your your goods is getting delayed off the port because there aren't the workers to really unload the ships. These are real issues. And how do you represent the biggest union push of any candidacy while bringing two sides to a table with carrots and sticks and the like? So two points to make there. Let's strip out the first one. What you do, you import more in the summer, which is what we saw, right? We saw some record imports. The West Coast ports were absolutely stacked. We talked about that a million times. The second point, I think, speaks to the amount of leverage these union workers actually have this week and for the next month going into the election. The president does want to get involved. The last thing the Democrats want right now is for this to spill over and become a much bigger issue. They'll be putting huge amounts of pressure. Just give them what they want. Give them what they want and let's move on from this issue quickly. I think the unions have a lot of leverage. They definitely have a lot of leverage because no one wants to see this become a prolonged crisis. A prolonged crisis is going to end up in the headlines and it could sour the politics but also sour the employers. President Biden, it's collective bargaining. I don't believe in Taft-Hartley, which means basically he could say, you have to go back to work, we need 80 days. This is mission critical. He doesn't believe in that. So the unions are basically saying, well, sounds like we have the upper hand. Look out for Danny Berger a little bit later on this morning on this story. Coming up this hour, we'll catch up with Norman Rule of CSIS following the assassination of Hezbollah's leader in Lebanon. We'll speak to Ed Mills of Raymond James as the economy outperforms in swing states and Brian Weinstein of Morgan Stanley with bonds on a five-month winning streak.
Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. We can do that with your Bloomberg Brief. Here's Yohara Hackers. Hey, Yohara. Hi, John. Japan's incoming prime minister is reportedly considering a general election within a month following his surprise victory as ruling party leader. NHK saying Shigeru Ishiba could call a vote for October 27th. A national opinion poll suggests public optimism for the new LDP leader is above 50 percent. Ishiba has said he intends to dissolve Japan's lower house early in his tenure. Meanwhile, meanwhile, vice presidential candidates Tim Walls and J.D. Vance will take the spotlight tomorrow night in a debate on CBS. The candidates will stand behind podiums in front of two moderators and without a studio audience. Vance has been prepping with Republican Congressman T Tom Emmer of Minnesota, while Transportation Secretary and one-time presidential hopeful Pete Buttigieg has been holding mock debates with Walls as part of his preparations. And at least 84 people are dead across the southeast after Hurricane Helene tore through the area as a Category 4 storm. Helene destroyed homes and left millions without power, while floodwaters are threatening more damage in Georgia and South Carolina. AccuWeather estimates the storm may be one of the costliest in U.S. history, with damages totaling anywhere from $95 billion to $110 billion. President Joe Biden, Vice President Kamala Harris, and Donald Trump I'll plan to visit the area this week. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahara, thank you. Appreciate the update. Plenty more updates from Yahara throughout this morning. Up next on the program, the Middle East bracing for escalation. They want to get their families back to those homes and kibbutzes uh, in the north. We want to see that too. Uh, we believe and continue to believe that an all-out war with Hezbollah, uh, certainly with Iran, is not the way to do that. That conversation up next, live from New York City this Monday morning. Good morning. Month winning streak potentially poised for on the SP 500. Equity futures right now just slightly negative. We're basically unchanged on the session. Yields are higher by two or three basis points. The 10 year 377. Under surveillance this morning, the Middle East bracing for escalation. They want to get their families back to those homes and kibbutzes uh, in the north. We want to see that too. Uh, we believe and continue to believe that an all out war with Hezbollah certainly with Iran, is not the way to do that. If you want to get those folks back home safely and sustainably, we believe that a diplomatic path is the right course. So here's the latest. The U.S. urging Israel to avoid triggering a wider regional war as it steps up air assaults in Lebanon. After killing Hezbollah's leader Hassan Nasrallah on Friday, a significant blow to the Iran-backed militant group, leaving the region on the brink. Leading our coverage out of the region, Bloomberg's Jamana Basechi joins us now from Dubai. Jamana, what's the latest? Well, the latest is that after the assassination of Hassan Nasrallah, there were going to be lots of questions about whether, one, Hezbollah were able to regroup themselves, and number two, how Iran would respond. And I think the comments that we got just in the last hour from a spokesperson from the Iranian foreign ministry are pretty telling here, saying that Iran does not want to send forces to Lebanon to fight Israel. And this is key, because if you think back to who Hassan Nasrallah was, he represented a very influential figure in not just Lebanese politics, but regional politics for the better part of the last four decades. He's been at the helm of Hezbollah since 1992. Hezbollah, of course, being the crown jewel in Iran's axis of resistance. And many of his detractors within Lebanon uh, despised the fact that uh, Hezbollah had sort of chipped away at Lebanon's sovereignty and put them under the Iranian orbit. And the fact that Today, even after the killing of Hezbollah, even after the wiping out of several senior commanders and the uh, critical injuries that many of the middle-level operatives sustained from those explosion devices, the, the device that exploded uh, last week, even with all of that, Iran is not saying that they're willing to get directly involved. And so that is pretty significant. Now, the other uh, factor to take into consideration here is um, the Lebanese state. And even though there has been a so-called state capture, 
uh, by Hezbollah and other forces within Lebanon the last couple of years. And indeed, what we have now is a caretaker government in Lebanon. The prime minister this morning uh, finally made some remarks. And what he said is that they, number one, are looking for a ceasefire on the border. And number two, that Lebanon stands ready to implement UN Resolution 1701. What is that resolution? That was the resolution that was put in place after the 2006 war between Israel and Lebanon that stipulated Hezbollah put down their arms and retreat away from the border. And of course, that is what the war objective that Israel is trying to achieve boils down to. Ultimately, it's about getting Hezbollah away from the border. The fact that the Lebanese government is now signaling that they're willing to do that shows a step in the right direction. The question, of course, is how Hezbollah respond from here and, of course, how Israel intend to respond to, because the airstrikes have continued overnight. We'll explore that right now. Jamana Basachi, Bloomberg's very own, out of Dubai. Jamana, thank you. Joining us now, the former senior national security advisor, Norman Rule. Norman, give us your thoughts on the events of the past week or so and how you expect Iranian strategy to change now, given the decimation we've seen to Hezbollah. Good morning. One correction, I was not the former national security advisor. Uh, um, that's a rather important position. I was just a humble intelligence officer. Uh, over the weekend, we've seen hundreds of Israeli strikes, and the nature of the strikes is telling. Uh, they've uh, attacked not only Lebanese Hezbollah targets, but they've taken out uh, major actors from the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. They've taken out a major Hamas actor, and they've also taken out uh, a Lebanese Hezbollah operative who trained Houthis. Uh, these are serious players and also shows the depth of uh, Israel's targeting. At the same time, we've watched Hezbollah uh, regroup. It has designated a uh, replacement to Hassan Nasrallah. Uh, they've assigned a hardline individual, uh, Hashem Saifedin, with long ties to Iran. His uh, son is married to uh, Qasem Soleimani's daughter. His brother is the Hezbollah representative to Iran itself. Um, uh, nonetheless, Hezbollah remains in disarray. Israel's plan is clearly to keep it on the uh, um, uh, in, in disarray through pummeling attacks constantly throughout the days. I'll conclude by saying Israel has not, however, yet achieved its goals of ending Hezbollah uh, strikes and allowing the return of its people. Uh, for this reason, um, uh, these, these attacks will uh, continue by Israel until there's a significant change in Hezbollah's posture. Norman, what I'm hearing from the U.S. administration is the worst case they're preparing for, at least in terms of retaliation from Iran, is akin to what we saw in April with the barrage missiles coming down on Israel. Could it get worse than that in terms of the worst case scenario response from Tehran? Well, Tehran's options are limited, and there is no public information that uh, uh, Iran has undertaken the preliminary steps that one would expect to see uh, to uh, launch such a missile uh, barrage. Um, Iran's ability to support proxies uh, relies upon a logistics line, which has been severed by Israel and is under military pressure. Iran's ability to support proxies involves other proxies. They're all uh, under great pressure from Israel or contained by the United States or have limited capacity. Uh, as long as Iran believes that you know, umbrella of defense by U.S. naval forces in the region is strong, I think it's going to be reluctant to undertake uh, uh, a missile attack. However, Iran will support diplomacy because its goal is a ceasefire that allows its proxies to survive so that they may be rebuilt by Iran after the conclusion of this conflict. Does this push Iran closer, potentially wanting to even develop further their nuclear capabilities? You could play this both ways. The answer could be yes, because Iran sees that its proxies are of minimal use as a defense and it requires something more significant. But you could also play this as uh, Iran uh, would think that after Israel's intelligence successes against Hezbollah and in Tehran itself, now's not exactly the time to undertake covert activity uh, that could be uh, uh, interrupted by an Israeli attack, assassination attempts, et cetera, et cetera. Just to build on that, there were a lot of notes over the weekend talking about how this was a likely outcome, the potential acceleration of nuclear development, even covertly, in Iran. Will the West just allow that, or will there be a more aggressive stance to really tap that down? It's not 
it's not known. It much depends upon the position of the United States. Uh, currently, Iran has been uh, producing 60% enriched uranium. That's not sufficient for a nuclear weapon, but it is military grade. And the United States, Europe, and Israel have not responded militarily to that uh, very serious uh, development, which would be intolerable or seen as even a causes belly only 10 years ago. So much depends on uh, what happens in the U.S. election, I think. What do you make of the silence from a number of other leaders in the Middle East with respect to the Nasrallah killing? Lebanese Hezbollah is considered to be a terrorist group by the vast majority of the Middle East. Uh, I have uh, dealt with such individuals routinely over the years, and I am sure they are delighted with uh, his passing. Uh, of course, they regret the loss of Lebanese civilian lives, but they understand that Hezbollah, like the Houthis and Hamas, all bury their military forces in civilian areas, and that's that's an inevitable consequence of conflict against Iran's proxies. But there is very little support for Hezbollah in the broader Middle East. Norm, is there a potential now, given what we've seen changing and the dynamics changing in the region, that in the lame duck session of the Biden administration, it could reopen a path to Israeli-Saudi normalization? I think that's unlikely as long as there um, uh, remains uh, an absence of a two-state solution. The Saudis have been uh, clear. They're looking for a process that is irreversible, provides a finite uh, conclusion for a two-state solution of a reformed Palestinian authority, reforms in the Palestinian authority, the removal of Hamas as a political actor, and uh, Netanyahu's agreement to a two-state solution seem awfully distant today. Can we dive into, though, potentially the removal of Hamas? Now that Hassan Nasrallah is dead, this was a key individual for Sinwar. Sinwar wanted this regional outbreak of a war. He wanted to Israel to have to fight on these two fronts. With him dead, does this potentially mean Sinwar will change how he's dealing with the U.S., with the Israelis via, via the Qataris in terms of a ceasefire agreement? I think that's unlikely, if only uh, because in part Nasrallah's successor is at least as hardline as Nasr Nasrallah, if not more so. Uh, Sinwar is also playing a long game, hoping that the uh, Western political pressure in Israel, Israeli fatigue, will allow him to survive and rebuild within Gaza. Uh, I think Sinwar, Yahya Sinwar's primary worry is Israeli special forces closing in on him, and uh, that will determine his uh, uh, posture towards any ceasefire agreement. Norman, zooming out, there was a lot of speculation over the weekend about what this means to the alliances between Iran and Russia and North Korea and China. There has been sort of a loose affiliation with a number of states that don't feel connected to the U.S. and Europe and those alliances. Do you expect any kind of response or any kind of tightening of the ties between, say, Iran and Russia and North Korea and even China, especially given the oil linkage on the heels of this? Or do you think that there will be fissures? All three of the actors, Russia, China, and Iran, are revisionist players. They seek to change the world order, to remove the United States and Western influence from that world order. But they're, they're, they, their economies don't fit well together. Indeed, Iran is a, and Russia are oil competitors. There are areas in which they can and do and will cooperate, some military cooperation, some economic cooperation. But it's not a natural and easy fit as an alliance. You will continue to see that relationship uh, progress. Uh, but Russia and China have shown they're really staying out of the Middle East conflicts. They're not uh, a major player in much of the diplomacy. Uh, and uh, like Iran, they haven't been able to uh, ha have much of an impact on what's happening with Israel's strikes on the proxies. Norm, we've got to leave it there. It's always great to get your insights, sir, on a Monday morning. Norman Rule there, the former senior U.S. intelligence official. Stand out in the market. What isn't happening? Crude last week, down 5%. Crude this morning, down two-tenths of 1% on WTI. Brent crude, down four-tenths. Still sort of uh, believing on the heels of some pot uh, potential pricing war out of Saudi Arabia as being a greater impetus in the market than any possible disruption right now. People are not viewing this as potentially disruptive to oil production in any way. Also, what we've seen over the course of now a year is that actual supply has not been hit. 
Sure. Have vessels had to change course because they're not going to go through the Red Sea because basically the Houthis are still um, running rampant in the Red Sea and they're having to go around the Horn of Africa? Yes. But has actual supply been hit? No. And until actual supply gets hit, you probably won't see it reflected in the price. WTI 68, Brent crude 71. Coming up this hour, we'll catch up with Ed Mills of Raymond James with swing states seeing faster growth than the overall U.S. economy. We'll get into that data next on the program. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning to you all with Equity Futures very close to all-time highs and just about unchanged on the session so far. Three weeks of gains on the S&P 500, staring down the barrel of a fifth monthly advance on the benchmark in America. Equity futures right now just about unchanged going into the close of September. On the Nasdaq 100, we're down about a tenth of 1%. On the Russell, we're down four tenths. We'll catch up with Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo a little bit later on the program. This is what Harvey's got to say about the move last week. A clear positive catalyst for some U.S. firms out of China. The 10 non-infotech S&P 500 firms with the highest percentage sales to China average they robust. 9.1% weekly return last week. There was a massive shot in the arm of this market from Chinese stimulus and the hopes and dreams were sort of fulfilled after so many years of the Chinese uh, authorities not coming to fruition. Question of how much will be uh, externally facing and a question of how much, I'm sorry, in advance, are we priced to perfection? I was just going through all of the data. We've had five straight months, if it holds today, which it will, uh, for the month of September, Five straight months of gains in the S&P 500, not for the NASDAQ, and it's all been driven by the equal weight. This has been a massive broadening out at the same time that yields are lower for five straight months. Can this continue with the idea that stimulus can stimulate just enough, but not too much? Well, let's talk about the yields. Yields are a little bit higher this morning, up by six basis points on a two-year, on a 10-year, up by three. Over the last week, though, the two-year and the 10-year really, really muted price action. The 10-year was down three basis points on a week last week. I think the two year was up by something like a basis point or something. It really wasn't much at all last week on a two and tens. Which I actually think is really interesting, especially because there were auctions and they didn't move the needle either. It's the sort of navigating the bifurcated tales and that story, which we really hear and will hear from Kathy Jones later on. She's going to talk about how she expects increased volatility on the long end with that increasing risk to potential yields going higher on the heels of an election, on the heels of some potential reignited inflationary reads, as well as going much lower in the chance that there is weaker than expected economic data. But it's hard to get a sense of how to price such diametrically opposed risks. So that's the US and China. Let's talk about a market that is truly, quite literally, on an island. Japan. Dolly yen had a move on Friday. It was the biggest one-day move lower, going all the way back to the start of August. So Japanese yen strength off the back of a new, essentially a new prime minister that's going to come in and ultimately endorse the normalization process at the BOJ. The Nikkei was closed. The Nikkei 225 opened up Monday morning and got absolutely hammered, down almost 5% to kick off the trade in week. Yeah, the potential for uh, him to support some sort of normalization. However, and this might explain why the yen is a little bit weaker today. Yesterday, the 67-year-old Shiba talked about how he wasn't that quick to normalize policy, saying, I don't think we should be talking about interest rates in a situation where we still can't say for sure that deflation has been defeated. So if you start betting on policy changes, Good luck to you, because we've seen a lot of flipping and flopping from all over the world. A little bounce on dollar yen, 142.73, that currency pair firmer by four tenths of one percent. Under Savannah's this morning, the top story worldwide in global markets, Chinese stocks entering a bull market, soaring for a ninth straight day as government stimulus brings back investors. The CSI 300 index jumping the most since 2008 in today's session after the biggest weekly advance since 2008. We've had a massive move in the uh, last week. How many notes did you read over the weekend? Tons. And how many really just all talked about, well, you can't fight this. Got to go into China. David Tepper's not a dope. Kind of have to gonna follow him. And you know what? Buy China because it's been really beaten up. But even if it's just a trade, well, it's going to do really well. That was pretty much every single person. I didn't hear one person saying, eh, I don't know, except for maybe the economists who are skeptical. Even if you don't like it, it's not something you want to get in front of. That seems to be the takeaway over the weekend. This was truly global. The Golden Dragon Index closed out the week last week up by 24%. If you take the basic resources names on the stock 600, they were up last week by 11%. Luxury stocks in Europe last week were up every single day. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday advancing 
Pick your spots. Is that the moment now to pick your spots to work out what's really durable and what's just a position squeeze because everyone was so underweight, anything related to China? Maybe. I mean, the idea here is that people from China, wealthy individuals, are going to go to Europe to buy. And that's sort of the key question. Will they or will there be more of a domestic focus? That said, it seems like on the margins, since a lot of businesses are still going into China, even if they're saying that they're not, you look at a lot of retailers, it's still a very big market. You have to imagine if just basically, if nothing else were, were different, it's going to be a boost. But iron ore up double digits today. And this is directly correlated to what's going on in the housing market. And that's when we saw the Chinese officials come out with really specific policy um, descriptions of what they're going to do. They've moved to lower the mortgage rates. And then three top cities, China's largest cities, relaxing rules for home buyers immediately trying to stir some of that momentum in the property market. So what do you do with the automakers, particularly when they tell you things like this? Stellantis, the latest automaker slashing its profit outlook for the year, citing plans to dial back production and spend more on promotional incentives. The report coming after Volkswagen issued its second profit warning in just three months. Stellantis is down by almost 14%. It's getting absolutely hammered, Bramo. And this is the challenge for anyone trying to play this China story. Ideally, in an ideal world, stimulus into the Chinese economy, boost demands for autos. Whose autos? That's the question. That's the problem for the European players. It's been pretty much the Chinese auto manufacturers in their entirety. When you talk about uh, some of the luxury brands in, uh, in Europe that are being sold into China, they are for very specific purposes to high-end individuals. It's not about the electric vehicle kind of uh, contract. But to me... This ultimately goes down to a, a couple different prongs for Stellantis. The fact that China demand is weak, the fact that there's overcapacity in Germany, and the fact that their lineup in the U.S. has been, I guess, lackluster for a lot of people. And how do you change that without some sort of overhaul? It's very difficult to do right now, given the labor situation in Europe. At home, they're dealing with this bungled transition on the EVs. And we've heard from European car makers. They're talking about the fact that Potentially, there needs to be some sort of subsidies. The way the politicians want them to get to the end game, they potentially need more help because the demand isn't there. And then when you go to places like China, the autos, when it comes to Audi, Porsche, absolutely hemorrhaging market share in the Chinese economy, then potentially you look at January 2025. And it might be a different U.S. administration. And there True. might be tariffs in the United States. And Europe is going to be stuck in the middle. And where does that growth come from? China has opened up the stimulus taps. It might not lift all boats. That'll be a debate for us through this week. And I imagine through to the end of the year as well. I want to get to this. We are quite literally watching a movie script being written in real time. SpaceX kicking off its mission to bring home two NASA astronauts stuck in orbit after flying on Boeing Starliner spacecraft. The SpaceX Crew 9 capsule carrying two people and two empty seats docking with the ISS yesterday. It's set to return with the Starliner duo next year. I love this story. I love that you're bringing this up because you just think it's outrageous that we're not talking every day about the fact that there are astronauts yeah. stuck in space. And why aren't we saying, like, how come we just are leaving a couple of astronauts stranded in space for an extra six months? I'm shocked it's not like the top story this year in this country. <laughs> Is that really the case? No, seriously. We'll keep bringing it up. Look, I do think it's interesting that it has to be Elon Musk's company going up there and bringing them back. Why are they going to have to wait until early next year to bring them back? Why can't they just bring them back, you know? As soon as they get there, like I don't have an answer go. for that at all. You got an answer for that? They're hitching their rides. I think it has something to do with when they can actually safely come back down to okay. Earth. Okay, it's a timing issue. Timing issue, but also this isn't a top story because yes, this is going on in, and in space, and at some point they will be safe, and they are safe right now, even though they're floating in space. While there are two hot wars happening on Earth, I get it, but you've got to turn this into a movie. Right, for sure. There's, I agree. There's so many movies that could be written from this year's politics, from this year's geopolitics, and from this year's space travel adventures. Elon Musk, saving the day. Let's turn to politics. Six of the seven battleground states expected to decide the U.S. presidential election, seeing faster growth than the U.S. economy as a whole in the second quarter. The data coming as recent polls show Kamala Harris closing the gap with Donald Trump on economic issues. Ed Mills of Raymond James joins us now for more. Ed, good morning to you, sir. I'm not sure if you've seen the same data, but it speaks to an acceleration in certain states that maybe the Democrats would like to see that acceleration. Is that gaining any traction with voters at all based on the polls that you see? So, John, I think this is something that the Harris campaign would absolutely welcome. Um, the problem has been throughout the last several years is that there's been a partisanship that's been entering into the conversation about how well the economy is doing. Um, the uh, data shows that voters are saying that disproportionately they feel the country is on the wrong track. Uh, so it's like, which will win out here? 
And, you know, certainly if we had downward revisions, uh, if it looked like uh, the United States was on the verge of a recession, that's something that Donald Trump would be hammering home. So the absence of a negative is a positive, uh, but it really does come down to the lived experience of voters who have been really concerned and they've talked about concerns about inflation. Um, certainly, we've had a much stronger economy this year than most had anticipated, and that is an edge for the Harris campaign. But at the end of the day, this is a close election. Close election. Maybe that's an edge right now. But, Ed, what happens when we have these port closures from Texas to Maine? Yeah, so we're monitoring this closely at Raymond James. Uh, starting tomorrow, we could see longshoremen uh, go on strike. Uh, the president has said he is not going to invoke his authority under Taft-Hartley, uh, which could say if there's a national security risk, you have an 80-day cooling off period. Um, I don't see this uh, dispute being something that lasts a really long time or disrupts supply chains without Biden reconsidering that. I think Biden has always said he wants to be the most pro-labor uh, president in the history of the United States. He doesn't want to do anything to undercut those longshoremen. But I guess uh, the, the feeling I've had with conversations with clients is that this is not something that he can allow to get terribly disruptive. We saw him in Congress getting involved uh, with rail workers uh, right before the midterm elections in 2022. Uh, the longer this goes, the more impactful this is, the more likely we see a federal response that kicks this beyond the election, trying to see if they could use that 80 day cooling off period to get to a new contract. How much will that hurt the incumbent that is running, Kamala Harris? Because so far, the campaign has done a good job to actually paint former President Donald Trump as an incumbent. Well, Amory, I think it is all about how impactful it is. If it is going to be that leading story, if we're going to get stories about folks not getting their shipment in time for Christmas, if we're going to be talking about supply chains, uh, anything that's a negative story for the economy is an entree for Donald Trump to talk about how he does not think the country is on the right track. And when we look at that voter data that we discussed, where about 70 to 75 percent of the country says repeatedly the country is on the wrong track, anything that ties Harris to something that exacerbates that issue, uh, it's a positive for Donald Trump. So that's why I don't think this is something that um, President Biden would allow for it to go all that long. But at the before it happens, I don't think he wants to do anything at all that undercuts the negotiating strength of the longshoremen. Uh, so that's why I think that it's going to be a story for a few days. But come Election Day, I think I'd be pretty shocked if we have foreclosures on the East Coast and the Gulf Coast. It just shows how actually the U.S. still keeps going and should be governed at some point, even though there's all this politicking that ends up taking up all the oxygen out of the room. And I keep thinking about these storms over the weekend uh, that killed almost 100 people, which is unthinkable given the sort of modern day expectations for the storm and the potential infrastructure. What do you expect from Congress, not only in response to the storm, which might be the most expensive storm to ever hit the United States, but also to prepare for it in advance since the there are some steps that could be taken and could be financed. Yeah, Lisa. Yeah, so, so I think that what we will look at is that Congress is in recess through the election. Um, I think a lot of people thought that we could be here the day before um, a government shutdown, and, and Congress took care of that last week, went home. Uh, if there is an immediate need, they could be forced to come back to D.C. Uh, before the election. I think more likely is Pretty soon after the election, we will see one of the largest aid packages uh, ever developed that will go to fund this reconstruction. Uh, there was the bridge collapse in Baltimore. That's been waiting for a vehicle. I'm also looking at other pieces of legislation. There's been a conversation here this morning about China. Uh, there's a series of anti-China legislation that's already passed the House. That's looking for a vehicle to move. So I'm looking at a pretty close to right after the election, big package to move that really funds this reconstruction. But what else gets added on is a big part of the conversation. Uh, what you're talking about, other things that could finance it. Uh, our government has had a long history of pre-disaster mitigation efforts. The problem here is that I think a lot of people living in some of the most impacted area, I look at Western uh, North Carolina, who thought that part of living in Western North Carolina was um, a a hedge against being impacted by a hurricane, especially at this level. Um, so I, I, I understand that there are pre-disaster mitigation measures that can be taken and, and finances should be given to those, but they are 
very difficult to pinpoint exactly, and, and the, the need is, is quite vast, actually. Ed, thanks for that. Appreciate it. Ed Mills there of Raymond James. Bramo, I think we can all sense your frustration for good reason. Devastating pictures over the weekend. This is a first world country, and we're seeing people drowning, getting hit by downed trees, uh, getting completely flooded out of their homes, complete neighborhoods that are devastated. And to Ed's point, some of this was in areas that typically were not zones that would have been in some sort of hurricane prone area. These are flooding pictures that we have not seen the likes of which in the United States, maybe ever. And you raise the question, well, what can you do? How do you get ahead of this? Oh, yeah. By the way, Congress is on recess right now and won't be addressing any of this. So how do we avoid pictures like this? And oh, yeah, hospitals getting flooded out. This is a major infrastructure. I just it boggles the mind. Yeah, it's it's devastating. These pictures. I was in North Carolina before this hurricane hit two weeks ago. And actually, the governor, Roy Cooper, was doing a number of events and meetings leading up to this, trying to prepare. They knew it was going to be bad, but I'm not sure they knew how bad it was going to be. And right now, they're just going to be dealing with a lot of emergency funding. Shocking pictures. And as we get more updates for you, We'll share them with you. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere as well. With your Bloomberg Brief, let's cross over to Yahira Hacker. Hey, Yahira. Hi, John. Aston Martin shares plummeting in London trading. The luxury car maker said it expects financial performance to be below market expectations, citing disruption in the supply chain and macroeconomic weakness in China. Aston Martin follows in the footsteps of larger peers Volkswagen, Mercedes-Benz, BMW and Stellantis, all of which cut their respective outlooks in recent weeks. Meanwhile, no one in sight for the strike over at Boeing Friday night. The union representing some 33,000 Boeing workers in the Pacific Northwest tweeted that talks between the two sides have broken off with little progress and further dates for talks have been scheduled. Boeing has offered wage hikes of 30 percent over the life of a four year contract and some enhancements to retirement benefits. But that's seemingly not enough for the union, which wants to shift from 401k packages to a defined pension plan. And California Governor Gavin Newsom has vetoed what would have be become one of the most comprehensive policies governing the safety of artificial intelligence in the U.S. The bill to hold AI developers accountable for harm caused by their products drew fierce criticism from some major tech firms who warned it could stall innovation. Newsom says he will consult with experts to develop workable guardrails. That's Jubilee McGree. John? Yahara, thank you. More from Yahara in about 30 minutes' time. I'm next on the program, Bonds on a five-month winning streak. The Fed has justification to cut probably 100 to 150 basis points just on the improvement in inflation alone. You are going to see front-end yields move lower than long-end yields uh, as the Fed continues to deliver those rate cuts. That conversation just around the corner, live from New York City this morning. You're watching Bloomberg TV. If you are just waking up, missing out on some big gains overnight over in Asia, the CSI 300 up by more than 8%, the biggest one-day pop over in China, going all the way back to 2008. Futures pretty muted here stateside. We're negative a tenth of 1%. In the bond market, yields are higher, up two basis points. The 10-year, 377. Under surveillance this morning, bonds on a five-month winning streak. You're not going to necessarily see materially higher yields just because the, you know, the labor market stays around here. The Fed has justification to cut probably 100 to 150 basis points just on the improvement in inflation alone. You are going to see front end yields move lower than long end yields uh, as the Fed continues to deliver those rate cuts. We do feel like we're getting closer to reaching an inflection point. So here's the latest. Treasury is on pace for the longest monthly winning streak in more than 14 years as investors price in deeper rate cuts. Brian Weinstein and Morgan Stanley writing the Fed is now seen as ahead of the curve. The door is totally open for another 50, but the bar is high. The Fed is better off dragging this one out. From here, having gotten off to a good start, Brian joins us now for more. So Brian, easing in China, rate cuts to the United States, the prospect of some inflationary policies in D.C., dependent on the outcome of the U.S. election. A lot of people asking the same question. Why aren't bond yields higher, not lower? <laughs> I think we'll get there. 
it's going to take a little while. Listen, I think the playbook says when the Fed is easing you buy bonds, right? People want to lock in rates. It's very rare. In fact, it's never happened before that we've come from such an inverted yield curve um, right into a right into an easing cycle. And so I think people are missing that the trades more or less already happened. But in the meantime, any weaker data, you know, any Fed easing, people will buy bonds. So I, I believe bond yields will be meaningfully higher than here. I think it's going to take a little while to get there. Let's just dig into that word, meaningful. Can we talk about that? You think we're at the bottom of a much bigger range. How big is that range? What is meaningfully higher? You know, listen, I came into this year saying 390 to 5, and obviously I'm a little bit off on the on the low side. So let's say it could be even a little lower, 325, 350. Um, I think when you look at a Fed with a terminal fund rate near 3, the yield curve should be at least 150 basis points steep. So that puts us at 450. If the terminal rate's 3.5 or 4, well, then you go a lot higher. So listen, I don't think we've seen the highs in yields for this longer cycle yet. So if we touch just short of, of 5%, I think you could see a 5.5% tenure note um, if the Fed does everything right, if the data gets better. And China easing is a big part of that story. So you need more stimulus, more spending, all the things we're going to get. I think you can get 10-year notes outside the range, which we've seen to the high side um, much later next year. This is counter consensus in terms of how high uh, the yield could potentially be in this cycle. It is not counter consensus when it comes to just volatility expected, especially heading into the election. How do you trade around this? How do you position for that type of whipsaw? Yeah, well, what's amazing is nothing's happening, right? We're kind of stuck in this 370 to 390 range. I mean, this is the tightest range. The rally, you know, the rally happened over five months, and now we're now we're stuck. So I think the answer may be: don't expect what I just said to happen anytime soon. Uh, again, people like fixed income; they want to buy bonds as the Fed eases. Um, and uh, and listen, the election. I don't know that unless there's a red sweep or a blue sweep, and there's a, a big uh, outcome that's unexpected. I'm not sure the market isn't ready for it. Right? We know we're going to get some more uh, stimulus after. We know we're going to help out the hurricane victims. It's a little slower than, than we'd like. Um, and so there'll be more spending. Um, but there's also going to be an economic slowdown, right? I mean, I don't think it's going to be huge from here, but inflation is still falling. So I think we're stuck in a bit of a range, maybe for stocks too. Uh, and then when we get through this, when we get into January, February of next year, um, and you see the effects of the Fed easing, um, I think you start to see higher rates. But it seems a little bit boring for right now. Well, see, this is what I was really struck with. And over the weekend, I spent a lot of time thinking about the idea of of how you navigate bifurcated tails, this idea that you have a potential hotter than expected economy or you have a potential weaker than expected economy. And right now, people aren't willing to make any kind of bets. They're just betting on perfection uh, in the middle for the foreseeable future. You're saying that we're not going to get a catalyst to change that until next year, that even though we're saying that Friday is the most important payrolls ever, that that's not necessarily going to tip the tide one way or another. I think it's, uh, by the way, I think you're right. I think we're priced for perfection and I think the tails are, are in play. The problem with, say, Friday's payroll is if the Fed hadn't gone 50, right, if the Fed had been stubborn, the payroll would matter a lot. The fact that they're ahead of the curve, now we know if it's weaker, they can go 50 again, so you can get a response. If it's if it's not weak and they did a little too much, the curve might bear steepen a little bit um, or maybe even bear flatten, right? Maybe we take out a, a, an extra ease. But at the end of the day, is it going to change the course of what they're doing? I don't think so, right? We know inflation went from 8 to close to 2. We know that employment is weaker than it has been, um, maybe not super weak. So it leaves me thinking as much as I don't like it as someone who wants to help their clients make money, you're, you're stuck in a range for a little bit longer, despite the fact that you do have these tail risks. And if we overreact to one, you probably want to fade it, right? Which puts you right back into that range concept. Brian, does this remind you of the inverse of pre-2020? The line that really got that going in my mind was we're a long way from neutral. I remember that line and they ended up being a lot closer to it than they realized. Are we going to see a repeat of that from the other side? I think it's possible, right? I mean, it, it feels like we're a long way from neutral, uh, but we don't know where neutral is. And we didn't expect five and a half to be necessary. And it was, which suggests that neutral is higher, right? The economy did not fall off a cliff when we got to five and a half. Um, and we're easing not because we we are in danger, but because we don't want to be. And that that's why I'm so emboldened with the higher rate call for later. I don't, I don't think neutral is going to be 2.8 or 3. I think it could be 3.5 or 4. Um, and so, yes, John, that's where we are, right? I, I think we're... we're we it looks like we're far from neutral uh, and we won't know until it's a little bit too late. And the impact of the eases won't be known until you know the middle of next year. So uh, a lot to learn, a lot to get through. Um, and I would be thinking not about what this easing cycle looks like in the next couple of months. I think it might be boring. It's what's on the other side of that. Agreed. Brian, it's good to catch up.
Thanks for catching up with us. Brian Weistin there of Morgan Stanley. Anne-Marie mentioned this line from Torsten Slock over at Apollo. The risk with cutting interest rates too much too quickly is that the economy becomes too hot again. That's basically what he's talking about. Put another way, maybe neutral, the neutral rate is a much higher level than what people are currently thinking, including Austin Goolsby and even Jerome Powell with, we're a long way from neutral, are they? We found out pretty quickly last time around that they weren't. Do you remember that? I do remember that. Yeah. That's the reason why 5.5% is his uh, top yield range. Coming up next on the program, Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo, Henrietta Trey's of Vader Partners, Bloomberg's Danny Berger on the prospect of port strikes in America. And we'll catch up with Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence from New York City, the second hour of Bloomberg Surveillance, up next. The employment data is really important. The Fed gets it. They understand that employment risks are actually going up. I don't think that the economy is going to do as well as the market is pricing in. I think it's getting a little bit over its skis. There is an excitement about rate cuts and the opportunities that they bring. But there's also this trepidation that what if that 50 basis point cut was a crisis cut? All the data from now until November are going to decide whether the Fed goes 50 or 25. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Ferro, Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. Excitement about China colliding with anxiety about payrolls Friday just around the corner from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. The second hour of Bloomberg surveillance starts right now with equity futures just off all-time highs and negative by about a tenth of 1%. On the Nasdaq 100, we look like this, down a tenth and change. On a Russell, a small caps, negative 0.5. The week ahead, full absolutely packed with jobs data that concludes on friday with payrolls friday really one of the main events of the week though a little bit later on this afternoon we're going to hear from the chairman himself jay powell is going to be speaking at a neve uh, conference national association of business economists with a q a and that is what i think might be most interesting how he sort of messages forward the idea of an outsized rate cut and how he understands the market's response i understand he's not going to say look i'm going to give you your review from uh, what I saw over the past couple of weeks, market, this is what I think. But in a way, he will, in terms of whether he calibrates some of his dovishness. When he talks about the fact that the Fed is still data reliant, then Friday becomes a really important. And when you have everyone coming on saying the bar, potentially our last guest, Brian, talking about the bar being high for 50, well, then you start looking at the recent labor data, and if you basically extract 60,000, 70,000 from a payroll report, is that what the Fed's going to be looking at? Because the revisions have been so bad to the downside. We're hoping Chairman Powell comes out. Price target, 6K, S&P 500, month end. Well, essentially, I mean, look, it, okay, take a step back for a second. If he gives a sense that he wants to cut 50 basis points, and he gives this sort of rhetoric like Austin Gould's be like, well, we're so far away from neutral. Don't worry about it. We got you. That's going to be basically, you know, soft lighting nirvana won't even describe it. You know, it'll sort of just be this euphoria uh, because you don't need the weakness to get the rate cuts. But if he comes out and he says now he can really calibrate it and moderate it and all those kinds of words, then eh, ooh. We want President Xi's price target, don't we? CSI 300, look at this gain overnight of more than eight full percentage points, the biggest one day pop going all the way back to 2008. Basically, they did it. They unleashed a lot of stimulus with the promise of war, completely changed the tone, going back to supporting housing even, which is something that they said they weren't going to do. Suddenly, what about deleveraging? Poof. And this sort of this feeling that something has changed from a messaging and from an action standpoint. And everyone has FOMO and doesn't want to get uh, sort of away from that. And they also have FOMO, FOMO because it's China's golden week. That's about to start. So they're getting in now while they can. The fear and greed indicator of the Shanghai Composite Index that measures buying and selling momentum for the stock. Most popular among China's retail investors rose to the highest since 2015 today. They're very excited in China. But the execution when it comes to the fiscal measures, I think, really matters for the real economy. Have you got a sound effect for that? I just noticed, you know, whoop, <laughs> what was the other one? Poof. You got any more? Well, you, I Perfect. can, you know, okay. I just, if you think about it, remember they were not going to say anything. They were talking about sort of, you know, national champions and this idea of people not being, you know, profligate, sort of corrupt sure. Americans and just getting handouts. And then it's like, here, have a handout. You know, have Houses me. are to be lived in and exactly. all of that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now it's like, no, it's to be supported. Like, so the Oof. idea is. Just like that. Just like that.
Perfect. Equities right now in the S&P 500, negative by a tenth of 1%. In the bond market, we are heading towards a fifth monthly advance in the Treasury market. Yield to lower through that period. Just a little bit higher this morning by a single basis point. On the 10-year, 376.57. Coming up this hour, we'll catch up with Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo. As the Chinese stock surge continues, we'll speak to Henrietta Trays of Veda Partners, looking ahead to tomorrow's vice presidential debate. And we'll catch up with Bloomberg's Danny Berger as the U.S. economy braces for a labor strike across the East Coast ports. We begin this hour with the focus on China. As Chinese stocks enter a bull market, the CSI 300 surging the most since 2008, closing out a nine-day winning streak going into a week-long holiday. Alibaba, Baidu and JD.com all delivering some major gains once again. JD up another 5%. Joining us now to discuss is Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo Securities. Chris Harvey, good to see you, sir. Good to see you, too. A bull works into a China shop. Your words, not mine. <laughs> that was the title of your note. What happens next? What happens next? Uh, that's really hard to say. Th this has run pretty far. What you're seeing in the U.S. is you are seeing it put on a little bit more risk avert, uh, excuse me, uh, risk seeking. It's putting hopes of cyclicality in there and, and it's helping the equity market. How long this lasts? Not sure because the underlying fundamentals still really tough. Obviously, there's a lot of short covering. Uh, obviously, the liquidity issues are, are driving things higher. But it's still a really tough situation. So I I'm not sure they're out of the woods. You went through the top 10 non-tech names on the S&P 500 with the biggest percentage of sales to China, and they gained week to date more than 9% last week. Why did you strip tech out of that story, just out of interest? Well, one of the reasons for tech is you see a lot of exposure to China, but they don't really sell to China. It, it's a back and forth between the US and China. So really what we want to do, we want to get the exposure of who's going to sell to the, the Chinese consumer, who's really going to benefit by the Chinese economy growing. And, and a lot of the tech companies, that's not really true. And so we'll focus. And what you see with, with the other list is you do see a lot of gambling or casino companies and, and some more retail. And that's really what we want to focus on is, is if you're looking for Chinese exposure, those are the kind of names you really want to go after. Are you in the camp of wanting to go after them? Are you a FOMO kind of guy? <laughs> I am not a FOMO kind of guy. Uh, we're not so excited about international exposure. What we're really excited about right now is we do think there's going to be a bit of a broadening out. We do think the economy is a little bit stronger than a lot of people uh, expect. And that's going to help your average stock. That's going to help your small cap. And we are, for the first time in a long time, probably years, have turned tactically positive on small caps today. Today you did that? T today. So what sort of went into that because they've been rallying and outperforming for quite a while and we yeah. have seen a little bit of a turnaround in some of the earnings reports. Why today did yeah. you make that call? So we've been looking at it. So since the end of the first half, we've been less negative, less negative, right? And one of the things that we saw with the rally last, um, last summer was, hey, the returns or the skewed returns are really important. And, and what I mean by that is we're looking at a presidential election. It's pretty much a coin. We think it's pretty much a coin toss, right? 50% Trump, 50% Harris. But small caps are going to act very, very differently under a Trump presidency versus a Harris presidency. And things are going to be skewed very, very positively for Trump. You have a very positive expected return heading into the election. And then, depending on who wins, that can continue going forward. So we're just looking at these expected returns and these probabilities saying, hey, this is a pretty good opportunity for small caps. And in addition to that, we do think that the economy is much stronger than people expect. And one of the things that we cite is the Atlanta Fed, which is up at 3% and consensus is down at 2 They've been a pretty good indicator. And the last time we saw GDP um, beat to the upside, small caps outperformed by about 2%. So we do have a catalyst here. So you think small caps do well even in gridlock. The conventional thinking has been, or a toss-up ahead of, ahead of the election, the conventional yeah. thinking has been small caps help Trump. So what yeah. happens if it's Kamala Harris and yeah. even a blue sweep come November 5th? Uh, it's, it's a great question. And so if Harris wins, what we think is the outcome for small caps over a one to three month period is in line returns to the market to down, to down about 3%. The issue with Harris is we don't really understand or, or know her policy and the market's not that comfortable. So we were trying to figure out how do you handicap Harris? And, and we're in a, a situation where you're post-easing cycle, the, the election's coming up, small caps have really underperformed. And we took all that and we combined that and we said, okay, what makes sense to us is more of an in line to down 3% type, type situation. Because typically you see a very positive reaction after the election, a so-so reaction after the Fed starts cutting, and recently it's been so-so. So we, we combined all that, we come up with an expected return that's just okay, right? So it really, 
you know, you're behooved to really make that bet that the market's going to start to price in this positive expected return. What are you still hoping to learn from Kamala Harris in terms of economic plan? Many say this will just be a continuation of Joe Biden in some senses, and they also did right. just put out an 82-page document. Yeah, I, I don't know if we're... I'm not looking to learn that much. One of the things I think the market is missing and one of the things that, that's a big risk is that if Harris wins, we probably see taxes roll off and that's not great for small caps. Now that won't happen initially, which is why we're still thinking of a, a small pullback or underperformance. But if we go longer term, that won't be great. And your, your point about um, Biden, and, and if you go back to Obama, Biden, Biden, and then potentially Harris, you're going to likely see a situation that's a lot more beneficial to growth and growth companies because some of their policies haven't been great for the economy or held back the economy whether it's related to regulation or other issues. And that's been a great environment for growth and growth stocks. Forgive me for getting super short term. Let's get super tactical, though. The next month, what do you think October is going to look like? Are we going to get that kind of policy anxiety in this market that provides a substantial headwind to yeah. stocks overall? John, one thing that, that's confused me is typically before an election, when you have this kind of uncertainty, you don't usually see equities go up, right? And now we've had some mitigating factors. We've had the Fed cut. We've had China, so on and so forth. So I do expect to see a lot more back and forth. And what I expect to see is small caps to outperform and the broader market to be more of a consolidation and maybe some downside. And so that's another reason why we're looking into to the situation. You really just haven't seen that uncertainty. And there's a lot of uncertainty there. To John's point, though, typically October is a difficult month. Right. Going into an election year, it's even more difficult. Right. Policy anxiety has been looming over uh, people's minds, but nobody wants to act on it until they're about a week away from the election. Right. Why do you think this market, even the small caps, can sort of shake that off? Yeah, I think they can shake that off because, again, if we go back to where the market is, where consensus is for GDP, it's down around 2%. I don't think we're in a 2% GDP market. I think it is, maybe it's not 3%, but I think it's a lot higher than that. One of the things that we talk about a lot on the show is that credit spreads IG credit spreads are 90, 89, 90 basis points over. That's not showing a whole lot of economic stress. And, and so when you ask us where that catalyst is, I think it really is the market realizing that the economy is a lot more robust than, than a lot of people think. Chris, what happens days after the election if we don't know who won? Oof. <laughs> that, I don't think that'll be a great situation. Uh, I think the market will have a, a real big problem with that. We expect to see volatility spike, I would expect to see the market to pull back. Until we get resolution, the market trades heavy in, in that kind of situation. That, that would be a really tough one. Chris, it's good to see you, good as see always. You. Thanks for the call on the small caps. Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo Securities and on China as well. I'm pleased he brought up some of the casinos. Las Vegas Sands last week up by close to 22% on a single week. All of a sudden, you have consumers that are being given cash infusions to go spend, and potentially, where do they like to vacation? Macau. Exactly. So this, to me, just shows how people are able to play this with more fail-safe FOMO trades. Futures down about two tenths on the S&P this morning. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning with your Bloomberg brief. Here's Yahara Hackers. Hey, Yahara. Hi, John. German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbach telling Bloomberg in an interview that the war in Ukraine is weighing heavily on the country's economy. And this is why we have to be aware that Putin's war of aggression is not only a military attack on Ukraine. This is hurting everybody. Why is our budget very much stressed, to say it very diplomatic? Because we thought that the war of aggression would never come back to the European continent. Baerbach also telling our own Anne-Marie Hordern that she supports Ukraine's request for long-range tourist cruise missiles, putting her at odds with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, who has so far ruled out sending the weapons over fears of triggering Russia further. Meanwhile, in Europe, Stellantis shares are falling after the Jeep maker slashed its profit margin forecast for the year. The car maker saying it plans to dial back production and spend more on promotional incentives in a slowing and more competitive auto market. CEO Carlos Tavares is facing pressure from investors, dealers and unions over declining sales, a dated U.S. vehicle lineup and bloated inventory. Meanwhile, AT&T is officially exiting the entertainment space. According to a new filing, the telecom giant has agreed to sell its majority stake in satellite TV service, DirecTV, to private equity firm TPG. The sale will total roughly $7.6 billion in cash payments 
through 2029 and give AT&T the ability to focus on its core business, which is wireless and fiber connectivity operations. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahira, thank you. More from Yahira in about 30 minutes time. Up next on the program, fighting for last minute momentum. The team that actually has a plan is the team of Trump Vance. It's pretty obvious to us that Donald Trump and J.D. Vance do not share our values in any way. That conversation just around the corner, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Equity futures on the S&P 500, negative here by a quarter of 1%. Just a little bit softer. Moments ago, Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo. Lisa, teeing up small caps for some outperformance here into year end. Talking about uh, just what he's seeing with respect to the earnings picture, but he kept going back to a theme, and I think that it's a really important one because it really dovetails off of what Brian Weinstein was saying. He believes this U.S. economy is much stronger than many people believe. He sees the uh, broad expectation by economists at 2% of GDP growth, completely in contrast to Atlanta Fed GDP's uh, 3% uh, prediction. And frankly, that has been more right than a lot of the econom economists' forecasts. Let's see if the data backs up that story throughout the week. Under surveillance this morning, fighting for last-minute momentum. Governor Walz and I are going to debate the issues that matter to the American people. And what I'm going to try to show is, is very simple, that the, the, the candidacy, the team of substance, the team that actually has a plan, is the team of Trump Vance. It's pretty obvious to us that Donald Trump and J.D. Vance do not share our values in any way. Elections have consequences. It is Donald Trump or Kamala Harris. So here's the latest. VP candidates J.D. Vance and Tim Waltz facing off Tuesday in the last confirmed debate of the neck-and-neck -neck presidential race, both attempting to boost each other's campaign's momentum while avoiding any damaging missteps just five weeks before Election Day. Joining us now to discuss is Henrietta Trace of Vader Partners. Henrietta, let's talk about that word, momentum. Who has it right now and who doesn't? You know, that's a great question. If we look at just the numbers, I had to uh, go over this a couple times. In August, the Harris Waltz campaign raised $287 million, and the Trump Vance campaign raised $85 million. So if you look at the expanding Electoral College map, the number of states that are now gray instead of red or blue, the momentum is plainly, I think, behind the Harris camp. And uh, I think that's something that she needs to grow in order to win. But that's been the story since she got into the race. But something we have seen the Trump camp do is go out and get free media, for instance. Donald Trump showing up this weekend at the Alabama-Georgia game. That is working more to his advantage. Does she need to do more events like that, get out there and be more in these, you know, interview or just, you know, by the seat of the, uh, of the chair kind of moments? Yeah, those campaign moments are so integral to Donald Trump, especially in galvanizing voters. Uh, Democrats are more galvanized this cycle than Republicans are. It looks a lot like the 2008 scenario. It's about 84 percent for Democrats to 71 percent for Republicans. So that enthusiasm going to a football game is also a great strategy there. The Harris team strategy is to go on very niche, specific media outlets, whether it's a podcast or a specific news outlet in a specific district and town in a swing state. So very micro-targeted. Um, and I think the earned media is something that will come up in the debate tomorrow night. Uh, you know, J.D. Vance and Donald Trump, well, J.D. Vance in particular, is the least popular person across the four people on the ticket right now. Tim Waltz is the most popular. So I think what they're going to be trying to do is generate a momentum event that, you know, captures voter attention, not, not tomorrow night, but the days ahead as, as the internet gets their hands on it. Henry, we've seen a widening gender gap in this election cycle. And you write in your note, though, that Trump's gains when it comes to the youth vote look like a mirage. Where is he winning and where is he not winning? Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up. The gender gap is also wild. We have to check the numbers again and again. The gender gap with Hispanic voters is 60 points. Uh, the gender gap with under voters under the age of 29 is uh, 47 points with women versus men. Um, it, it's really quite stark and sort of a battle to see who really wears the pants in America this year. Um, the minority, excuse me, the youth vote is one where the Trump gains from the entire year on the national scale 
are not showing up in uh, very specific sort of gold standard youth polls, that of John Del Volpe out of Harvard. And they show quite clearly that any gains Trump has made with young male voters, particularly those on the younger end of the spectrum, not sort of the 29 to 35 cohort, but 29 and under, are being superseded by the 70 percent support that Kamala Harris gets with all young women. Um, and so that that's, I think, really the story of this election is the gender gap. Henrietta, when I talk to Democrats, the idea they give me, even Governor Cooper, is that they have 2008 vibes, basically, when Obama won. But when you look at the gender gap, doesn't that spell 2016 vibes when Hillary Clinton lost? Yeah, I, she's doing much better than Hillary Clinton was doing uh, with female voters. The areas where there is not such a gender divide or exactly where you would expect, it's in the swing states. So if you dig into the data out of Arizona or Nevada, um, North Carolina, Georgia, the gender gap is not as severe as it is nationwide. So what you really want to keep your attention on and to bring it back to the momentum play is Harris still has work to do across not just the Rust Belt, which is not in any way safe for her, but also the Sun Belt, though Nevada in particular looks a lot better than I would have anticipated just four or five months ago. Um, so she's definitely making gains there, but the, swing, the, the gender gap is smallest in those swing states. Henrietta, right now, amid all the politicking and the planned debates, there are two cute, acute issues facing the United States. We have, of course, the dock worker potential strike and what that could mean in terms of disrupting trade. We're going to speak about that in just a minute with our colleague Danny Berger. But we're also dealing with the aftermath of one of the most damaging storms that's hit the United States in a very long time, hitting North Carolina in particular, which is a swing state. What are the responses that you're looking for from the candidates that could be constructive or could be potentially damaging? Yeah, this is the the hurricanes obviously are very close to home for me, and I focus on how long it's going to take those those districts and towns to come out of this. We're looking at months of recovery time. That is a large swath of the Trump population. Uh, happens to be a place where I vacation regularly. It's it's very red down there. So I'm nervous about their um, voting prospects and turnout that's going to be happening while people are literally just trying to rebuild their homes. Getting all that hurricane up in North Carolina is, is way too far to the north for anybody to be comfortable with. And they're going to be reeling from that for years. I expect that the Harris and Trump campaigns are going to start going there. Not once it's you know appropriate, uh, but certainly by the end of October to try to turn out the vote there. And then on the labor front, you know certainly it's a major issue for the lumber uh, yards and uh, something that I think the Biden team has shown repeatedly that they prioritize. But obviously this could start tomorrow, so they need to get on that. How does Biden prevent this from becoming his Katrina? Um, I, I think having a very swift response. I mean, the problem is Congress is already out of session, so they will not be passing an emergency appropriations package. Uh, but there's a lot that the president can do in terms of declaring an emergency, which he did before the storm hit, I believe, in Florida and North Carolina, and continuing that effort and, and keeping the focus on it. But it takes it takes months and years to come out of these kinds of um, climate events. And that's something that Biden and then the next administration is going to have to prioritize. Well, when you look at what the president has done over the past five days is already he's opened the floodgates for federal funding for these uh, for these areas. When you look at potentially more crucial funding down the road, it'll be, as you said, five, 10 years out that Congress actually could potentially put some packages together. No, they'll pass another spending bill in mid-December, and that bill will include, I would I would expect, substantial amounts of aid, billions of dollars in aid to these states. It's just that they're gone right now, so they physically can't come in and vote. They're, they're all on the campaign trail in their districts. You know, the House is extraordinarily competitive this year. The Senate has a whole spate of swing state senators that are up for re-election. So all the members are gone and they can't take those votes, but they'll be back in the lame duck and they'll be voting on an appropriations package which emer with emergency funding in December. Henrietta, always appreciate the breakdown from you. Henrietta Trace of Vader Partners on the latest in this country. Domestically, things getting messy and getting messy quickly. You just have to think uh, that these are two pivotal potential events. You have a situation where you could get a strike that could take off $7.5 billion per week that it goes on to the GDP. But then you think about a storm that was catastrophic. We are still tabulating the missing and the dead from this storm, and it was destructive in a swing state that will keep a lot of people away from the polls. So you just have to wonder how this is gonna potentially tip the scales. I'm gonna make a good point. If you're trying to rebuild your home, are you really going out to vote? Is that really top of mind in, in five weeks' time? It's not your priority right now, that's for sure. Coming up on the program, we'll catch up with Bloomberg's Danny Berger in Newark, New Jersey, as East Coast dock workers prepare to walk off the job. 
The latest on the ground up next on the programme. Equity futures on the S&P 500 negative here by two tenths of one percent. As we close out the month of September, your bond market yields higher by a single basis point on a 10 year, on a two year up by three. If you want to know the latest out of China, up, up and away. The CSI 300 closing out the day up by more than eight percent before a one week holiday. We got the biggest one day gain going back to 2008 from New York. This is Bloomberg. Two hours away from the opening bell, equity futures pulling back just a touch. We're down two tenths of one percent on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, we're down a third. On the Russell, we're down six tenths of one percent. This is child's play. Check out China. CSI 300 absolutely exploding once again overnight, up by more than eight percent. Biggest one day pop since 2008. And here are the gains. Baidu, Baba. JD.com. JD, up by more than 5%. It's a golden week, and people have money to spend nice. because the government just gave them some. I got you saw what I did there. Look, this is basically a trade that nobody can come up with a reason to get against. Maybe we would have gotten some uh, words from the Chinese authorities pushing back a little bit against the gains. They love this. So this, to me, raises a question. Have we seen a market shift in the sentiment and the approach of Xi Jinping's, Xi Jinping's administration. Because to me, that's really the crux of this. Have they moved from a less ideological kind of bent to one that is much more driven by economic support? Investors certainly get what they want at the moment. They got the cut from the Federal Reserve. They're getting the stimulus out of China. Is there more to come from the Federal Reserve? Look out for the likes of rate cut euphoria on Friday if we get a real downside surprise on the jobs rate report. Yields are up by three basis points on a 10-year at the front end of the curve. We're still just south of 360 on a 10-year, 376.38. The estimate for Friday, the median estimate in our survey, 146K. The previous month, 142. If you're looking for unemployment, looking for that to stabilise at 4.2%. And if you're looking for the teaser, the appetiser to all of that, Chairman Powell, a little bit later this afternoon. Yeah, and to me, it really matters whether those outsized potential cuts could come, even if there is benign news, even if we get the kind of labour market Market report that a lot of people are expecting? Or does he say we need to now move slowly and really calibrate whether or not we're dealing with truly a slowing economy or one that actually has some strength underneath it? That will make the difference between a turbocharged, extra euphoric, out of your mind excited kind of market versus one that's tempered between the bulls and the bears. Brian Weinstein was on a little bit earlier from Morgan Stanley making a case for higher bond yields. That's been a debate of the moment, I think. Easing out of China, easing out of America, the backdrop for growth in the States, arguably still OK, based on the very sort of top line headline jobs numbers we've been getting. And ultimately, we've had people ask, why aren't bond yields higher? And a big reason why is because a lot of people are kind of straddling this idea of the Torsten Slock, as Anne-Marie mentioned, kind of point that maybe we have a much stronger economy with a higher neutral rate versus the people like Andrew Hollenhorst of Citigroup, who's calling for a 70,000 payrolls print and potential downside risk, the idea that we're far away from neutral. So it's the Austin Goolsbees of the world versus the Torsten Slocks of this world. And we're smack dab in the middle trying to figure out which way we're going to swing. With a 10 year at 376. Under surveillance this morning, the U.S. urging Israel to avoid a wider regional war as it steps up air assaults in Lebanon. The U.S. sending more troops to the region and putting more forces on standby. And they're preparing for potentially an Iranian response would be, you know, individuals I'm talking to, uh, you know, on this side and outside the United States, potentially expecting the worst that it could be is back to what happened in April when Iran sent that barrage of missiles over Israel. But you'll talk to some U.S. officials and they'll say what Israel has able to do, basically put Hezbollah on its back and within 10 days, pretty much decimate rank and file all the way to the top up with Nasrallah dead and Iran coming out and not looking for that regional war, looking to de-escalate at this moment. Some U.S. officials will say Israel would not be able to do this without the cover of the U.S. in the region. And it looks, sounds like the United States is going to be sending more. I love that the U.S. is saying, Israel, pump the brakes. Don't do too much. Please, show restraint. Israel does something. Show a little bit more restraint. We're going to try to, you know, rein you in. And then they do this, and Israel's like, I don't know, keep going. I mean, basically, that's basically uh, the tone that has been out there. You take a step back, you wonder, this is the beginning of a new phase of something. What is that? What are we looking for? If Iran's not going to respond, does this mean more nuclear acceleration in terms of the production in Iran? Does it mean, you know, potentially rebuilding some of these proxies? 
it's not over. And yet people are looking at this as a, a movie almost unfolding, even though there is a lot of very real consequences uh, that are both uh, potentially transformative. I'm pleased you're drilling down on this particular dimension because I think it's important. Where does it leave Iranian strategy now? Where does it leave them? Well, it's very challenging for Iran. Hezbollah was the crown jewel, as Jumana mentioned earlier, of the axis of resistance in the region. And Hezbollah has been decimated. Of course, there's still individuals there. But between the pagers, which hit rank and file, and then I'm still trying to work out if the pagers were a precursor that Nezrallah had to convene all of the top brass to come out and speak in person because they were so worried about their technology being tracked. And then they were able to hit him. Iran is basically left with a lot of questions on how are they going to work within this regime. And to Norm's point, it, there's a question of whether or not this push them, pushes them more towards nuclear acceleration or pulls them back. Lisa talked about the movie. There are going to be plenty of books written on the developments of the last few weeks, that's for sure. Lisa also mentioned this story a few times this morning. It's one of the biggest developments in this country in the last few days. Floodwaters threatening more damage in the aftermath of Hurricane Helene. The storm killing at least 84 people after making landfall in Florida and stretching across the nation's south. AccuWeather estimating the total damage may be between somewhere between 95 and 110 billion dollars. We've seen this before in terms of flooding being the real damage and the flooding is continuing sort of akin to what we have seen in the past. We also have a lot of people or reports of people who are missing. I'm just wondering how do you deal with this with a Congress that's not in session and with people who are making politics of this on both sides. How do you end up dealing with a very real you know, humanitarian issue of getting people rescued and back in their homes and fortifying some of the essential infrastructure, but also longer term, how do you prevent against this at a time when it's gonna require some real investment? Well, we hear from the president today, he's gonna to be speaking about this. And over the weekend, he was speaking to Governor Kemp, Republican of Georgia, Governor Cooper, Democrat of North Carolina about what the federal government can do immediately. Your point on Congress, very well taken, but that kind of funding will be very acute. Do they even know what to fund in that sense? The most needed funding right now will be coming from the federal government. And Biden has pretty much said, we're here, we'll give you what you need. The president will be focused on this event as well. East and Gulf Coast ports are preparing for a shutdown as labor talks stall before a contract deadline later on today. The International Longshoremen's Association will post an updated statement on Facebook. President Biden saying he won't intervene in any strike, telling reporters that resolving the dispute is a matter for collective bargaining. Bloomberg's Danny Berger joins us from a shipping port in Newark, New Jersey. Danny, how close are we to this strike? About 16 and a half hours, John. By all indications, with no talk scheduled, with the White House not intervening, the strike will go on on something unless something remarkable changes. So at 12.01 a.m. on Tuesday, as the head of the Longshoremen's Association put it, a sleeping giant will be awakened. This is some half of trade that comes into the U.S., that the ports will be affected, 36 in total, all along the East Coast and the Gulf. The two main sticking points, they want a significant wage and benefits increase some 80 percent over the next six years. The current offer up, the Longshoremen's Association, has called it stingy. The other big sticking point is automation. They want significant language written into the contract to prevent automation that we see in the ports of Asia, that we see in Amsterdam. They do not want that for fear of jobs loss. Now, they have significant leverage at this time, more than they have in some time, considering it is administration friendly to labor. And there's a supply demand issue. There are not enough people to do these jobs. So it is leverage, which ironically is part of the reason that these employers want to put automation in in the first place. And of course, the other point of that leverage is this administration definitely does not want to see a spike in inflation before November 5th. Danny, can you give us a sense of what the timeline is now for these talks? Well, so the contract expires at midnight. So we, again, are just talking hours away from that kind of thing. But there are no scheduled negotiations. Everything we know about what's been offered, that's been happening behind closed doors, too. It is not it is has not been made public. From what we understand, the White House has been trying to act as a mediator. But again, this is happening behind closed doors. The timing does get tricky because even if these ports are just shut down for a few days, that has ramifications that last weeks by some 
some measures, just one day of shut ports will take a week to clear out. So days turns into weeks. If it is a week long strike, it means months. And that's when you start running into the issue of the holidays. Sure, some of these retailers have been stocking up, but places like small businesses don't have the capacity to hold up inventory. So again, this needs to be resolved in just a few days in order to not have a bigger economic impact. Do we have a sense, Danny, uh, of how many protections have been baked in, whether it's maybe rerouting maybe some of these ships to the West Coast ports or delaying some shipments, given the stockpiles and just hoping that things get resolved in three weeks time? Well, so ports like where I am here in Newark, the head of the port workers here has been calling before to get things sped up. They've basically elongated hours heading in today in hopes that they would be able to do it. But that can only get you so far. You were just talking about Helene, especially with the southern ports. There have been a lot of trucks who've been unable to traverse the south of America because of the hurricane, meaning it's been harder to kind of speed things up, get ahead of this. When it comes to the West Coast ports, there is an idea of solidarity. The head of the longshoremen is Association has said that the West Coast ports will not cooperate with diverted shipments. So that's not so much of a probability. And also HSBC says that they can only handle some 17% of the cargo coming over. Canada, the port of Montreal, is also dealing with its own strike. So Lisa, in terms of alternatives, there are not a lot right now. Danny, appreciate the update. Plenty more from Danny throughout the day on Bloomberg TV and on Bloomberg Radio. To continue the conversation, Lee Klasko of Bloomberg Intelligence joins us now for more. Lee, I want to stay on Lisa's line of questioning. We saw some tremendous volume going through West Coast ports through the summer. How much preparation was done ahead of time for the potential of this playing out? Well, I think the ports were ready and they also had the capacity to handle more freight. Um, you know, I think more sophisticated shippers have been ahead of this uh, looming port strike, which has been well telegraphed for quite some time. Um, you know, what we could see, you know, from our perspective, because, you know, we cover a lot of uh, transportation companies, this could be a net benefit to a lot of the trucking companies and intermodal providers out there, because this should boost rates. Rates for the uh, trucking market and intermodal market have been pretty depressed over the last two years. Uh, and, and so this could be, you know, the final shock to the system that could move uh, rates higher, uh, which would be a net net positive for trucking companies and intermodal providers like J.B. Hunt or Knight Swift or Hub Group. Lee, how long can this go on before some of these workers that might be on strike lose a lot of leverage, whether it's uh, financially for themselves or whether it's just in terms of the public zeitgeist for their actions? Yeah, I mean, for them, for the, the fatigue that might happen from a strike as a prolonged strike, I mean, these folks really aren't getting paid when they're not working. And, uh, you know, they also have their own bills to pay. So, um, you, you know, as this goes on, uh, it, it could, you know, weaken their resolve to be striking. Uh, we don't we, we are expecting a strike. Uh, we don't expect a strike to last more than a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, we think that if it goes on beyond a week, the federal government will step in uh, because of the impact that it will have on the economy. Uh, the good news is a lot of the, the economic uh, impact is really going to be delayed versus loss. Uh, some of that will be lost. Uh, but, you know, the numbers that you hear, whether it's five or six billion dollars a day, really isn't lost and like gone in, into the ether world. Uh, it, it'll come back. It'll just be delayed, uh, you know, as the ports kind of either work through the congestion that could be created in the West Coast or the congestion that's going to be created in the East and Gulf Coast uh, when the ports start going back to, to work. Lee, over the weekend, President Biden said that he doesn't believe in Taft-Hartley, but you think the federal government will get involved. How will they do it? I, I think they, they probably might have to enact that. I mean, that's just, you know, our view. Uh, just given the, you know, economic impact, I mean, we are a, an election year. Uh, as you know, GDP growth is not great. It's, it's tepid at best. Uh, and we want to keep that GDP growth positive. Uh, the longer this goes on, the more it could, could impact that GDP growth. And again, whether it's short term, uh, that those, those numbers do matter, not only to all of us here, uh, you know, that, that cover the markets, but, you know, uh, people in Washington as well. Lee, let's say he does go forward with that and activates an 80 day cooling off period. How much work would actually get done on the East Coast ports? That's a great point. You know, uh, they will probably be working not at full speed, but, you know, uh, there will be throughput at the ports. That throughput will be very limited. You know, from what we understand, the two parties are very far apart on pay. Um, 
from what we understand, you know, it, they're, and they're also, um, you know, the union does not want any automa any further automation, uh, which, you know, could be a huge sticking point because, you know, ports want to be more efficient. Uh, I think, you know, what the, the, the workers and the unions might want to focus on, on, on the new jobs that might be created through these, uh, these uh, automation processes. You know, there might not be someone uh, working a, uh, a crane, but it's the people that are, that are fixing the equipment that, you know, that could be creating new jobs on the port. Lee, you mentioned they're far apart. How far apart? What's one asking for and what's the other offering? Uh, I don't I don't have uh, intimate knowledge of it, but from what I've seen uh, in, in various reports in the press, uh, you know, they're looking for a, a ten dollar an hour raise and, and the ports kind of like half that. Uh, so they're, they're 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 pretty far apart. The eastern port workers, for whatever reason, from an hourly basis, make uh, less than their West Coast counterparts. And I think the East Coast po uh, port workers are looking to get the parity to the West Coast. I don't know if it's an apples to apples comparison, but that's the stuff that I've seen out there. Um, you know, in, in the earlier report, you know, they talked about the, the union is in a good position to be negotiating. Um, obviously they are, uh, it, we're coming up on the busiest time for uh, freight as freight comes in uh, ahead of uh, the holidays. Uh, and it's very important for retailers to have, you know, uh, goods on the shelves when customers come in and want to buy it. So it's very important and that's why the ripple effect will be felt. You know, you could see more air freight. We haven't really seen much air freight movement be diverted uh, from the ocean yet, but we could see that. You're gonna see a lot more truck movements uh, as freight needs to be expedited. Uh, so net net from, if you cover the freight transportation logistic companies, it's going to be a positive, um, obviously a negative uh, for the economy, a negative for the port workers, uh, and, and, and negative um, for shippers as well, because they're going to be paying higher freight rates. And a tough month for the president, potentially as well. Lee Klasko there of Bloomberg Intelligence, Biden, between a rock and a hard place. Well, he said over the weekend he's not going to, or he doesn't believe in Taft-Hartley, but then we just heard from Lee there that this is potentially what the government's going to have to do. So I already, in my mind, and thinking what the Trump campaign is going to put out as a last-minute campaign ad when they want to go for the rank-and-file union workers, President Biden, I don't believe in Taft-Hartley. President Biden, right before the election, I'm going to have to enact Taft-Hartley because we have to get these workers back. Good news for Biden. He's not running for a second term anymore. Let's give an update on stories elsewhere this morning with your Bloomberg Brief. Here's Yahara Hackers. Hey, Yahara. Hi, John. DirecTV and Dish agreeing to a deal that will create the largest pay TV provider in the U.S. Under the terms, DirecTV will acquire Dish from Echo Star for $1 while assuming $9.75 billion in Dish debt. The deal is dependent on Dish bondholders agreeing to take a haircut on the principal amount by about $1.5 billion. The two sides expect to close the deal in the fourth quarter of next year, pending regulatory approvals. Turning to the silver screen, The Wild Robot premiered at the top of the domestic box office this weekend. The movie, based on Peter Brown's best-selling books, brought in a better-than-expected $35 million in ticket sales. In second was Warner Brothers Beetlejuice Beetlejuice, which has grossed more than $250 million in four weeks. Paramount's Transformers 1 came in third place. And the moon has some company. An asteroid the size of a 33-foot school bus is trapped in Earth's orbit for the next two months. Astronomers in South Africa first spotted the asteroid, named 2024 PT5 in August. The mini moon is expected to circle the Earth for 57 days without completing a full orbit. It won't be visible without the use of a relatively large research-grade telescope, according to the astronomers. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahara, thank you. Appreciate it. Up next on the program, navigating U.S.-China tensions. We're exporting, exporting American technology, which is really terrific for the United States, uh, that the world is built on, NVIDIA, on American standards. Uh, NVIDIA is, a, is an American company, and, and um, our government and the administration would love to see us succeed. Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence, up next.
Stock market just a little bit softer state side. We're down by 0.3%. Bond yields just a little bit higher, up two basis points. The 10-year, 376.76. Under surveillance this morning, navigating US-China tensions. Well, we have to defer uh, all of the, all of the uh, policy making to uh, the administration. We're exporting, exporting American technology, which is really terrific for the United States, uh, that the world is built on, NVIDIA, on American standards. Uh, NVIDIA is, a, is an American company, and, and um, our government and the administration would love to see us succeed. So here's the latest. NVIDIA getting squeezed from both sides. Bloomberg reporting Chinese regulators are discouraging companies from purchasing NVIDIA's H20 chips used for developing and operating AI models. The move is meant to boost China's domestic chip makers. NVIDIA also facing domestic pressures amid an antitrust probe. Bloomberg's Mandeep Singh joins us now for more. Mandeep, can we get into the word discouraging? What does that mean in practice? I mean, basically, the government is telling them to be more self-sufficient in terms of, you know, their use of chips required for training these large language models. And they would rather have them use a Huawei or, you know, a domestic chip maker uh, for training these chips. Because everyone realizes that, you know, for the scaling laws to play out and everyone believes, you know, the next large language model will be bigger, you need bigger clusters. And that's where I, I think the government sees that, that this is a long super cycle. I mean, you just can't be reliant on an NVIDIA and spending, you know, billions of dollars in CapEx on technology that's not homegrown. And I think that's the message here. Mandeep, the West has been trying to restrict NVIDIA's exports into China already. I just wonder how that's really sort of hurt the company going forward anyway. Does this make a big difference to them? It, it does. And I think the export controls here seem to be working for the government, not so much for NVIDIA, who had, you know, almost a 20 percent revenue exposure to the China market. So that revenue exposure is uh, declining. And uh, uh, I mean, all this suggests that it will be an even lower portion of their overall uh, revenue growth. So clearly, you know, for a company that is growing exponentially, everyone expects them to keep doing uh, that kind of uh, maintain that kind of growth run rate, this is one less market for them to sell to. And remember, the largest internet companies after the hyperscalers here are in China. I mean, your ByteDance, your Alibaba, these are the companies that are training their own large language models. So if NVIDIA can't sell to them, I, I think they have fewer buyers for their chips, albeit, you know, these are some of the largest hyperscalers here. But clearly, I, I think in the long term, it affects their growth rate. Definitely the long term trajectory looks like China is going to urge potentially even more for these companies to stay away. But when you look at these companies, what can they get that is so similar to that semiconductor that NVIDIA is selling? Look, I mean, the best proof point we have is what Huawei smartphones have done. And uh, what you have seen is Huawei shipping those smartphones. Uh, there has been some uh, domestic adoption to the point that they have taken share from Apple. And similarly, you could argue, you know, if Huawei can create a chip for the smartphone market, why can't they create a good chip for the server data center market? And I think the bet here is with all the subsidies that Huawei units are getting from the government uh, and with their own foundry, SMIC, in China, they should be able to catch up. I mean, they're not going to have a TSMC latest chip uh, that NVIDIA is making, but uh, they should be able to get closer over time. And given this is a multi-year bet, the government wants these companies to focus on it right now and, you know, plan for the future. Mandeep, on the flip side, how much is the U.S. actually restraining uh, development and innovation given either antitrust issues as well as some of the regulation on large language models? Well, I mean, I look at it this way. There are open source versions of large language models that are released by Meta. So open source is available to all. And, you know, for companies that are domiciled in China, they know how, what they need to do in terms of catching up, uh, you know, to the latest uh, models that are being released by OpenAI or by Google that are closed source. So I, I think when it comes to regulations, yes, uh, you can prevent China from getting access to the chips. But what if they are able to get access to the latest ASML machines, the EUV machines on the foundry side? So. There are all these different aspects where uh, the geopolitical as, uh, you know, tensions come into play. And I feel the export controls on the chip side are working because the H20 chips that NVIDIA is shipping, 
clearly it will hit a wall in terms of scaling. And if uh, the government is not allowing the next version of the chip to be uh, given to the Chinese companies, I think it will have an impact on their LLM uh, training process and the scaling uh, that I mentioned before. Mandeep, it was good to get you on. Mandeep Singh there of Bloomberg Intelligence. The last week with regards to China, not a moment for nuance. This whole market worldwide just ripped on that story. Now it's a moment for nuance. It's not going to benefit everyone. Autos. Biggest loser on a stock 600 over in Europe today. There is a lot of divergence that's happened between now and before the pandemic between the U.S. and China. And we're going to see that come to the fore. Up next in the third hour of Bloomberg Surveillance, we'll catch up with Venu Krishna of Barclays, Sheila Kaolu of Jeffries, Aditya Bave of Bank of America Securities and Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab. The third hour of Bloomberg Surveillance, up next. The employment data is really important. The Fed gets it. They understand that employment risks are actually going up. I don't think that the economy is going to do as well as the market is pricing in. I think it's getting a little bit over its skis. There is an excitement about rate cuts and the opportunities that they bring. But there's also this trepidation that what if that 50 basis point cut was a crisis cut? All the data from now until November are going to decide whether the Fed goes 50 or 25. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Ferro, Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. The opening bell, 90 minutes away. Equity futures backing away just a little bit. We're down by a quarter of 1% on the S&P 500, but still very close to all-time highs after a third week of gains in last week's session. If you look at the equity market story this morning, futures just softer by a third. On the Nasdaq 100, down a half. On the Russell, the small caps negative 0.7%. Nothing like what we saw out of China overnight once again. A gain of more than 8%. The story stateside looks like this this week. Payrolls on Friday, looking for something in at around 140K. Don't forget this, Chairman Powell this afternoon. Powell speaks. We'll all be listening. If he says, I like 50, 50 is a great number. Let's go again and again. And honestly, we're still doing okay. So this is just a matter of us being really far away from neutral. Can you imagine? Talk about, hey, Xi Jinping pass the beer. I mean, this is going to be a real kind of juicing of some of the euphoria that you've heard. If you hear moderation, that's going to be more interesting because it is a lot harder to get excited about a negative read on this labor market on Friday. When it comes to potential moderation, you're talking about 140 penciled in, round and about. Take that in half is what you mentioned also last week from Citigroup's Andrew Hollenhorst. He's looking for 70,000 on Friday's print. But reiterating the fact, I think many market participants say, which is nothing matters more between now and the Fed, and that's NFP. We get a 70 on Friday. I don't think it matters what Chairman Powell says this afternoon. 70 is far more important than going another 50 on November 7th. Yeah, this is Mike Wilson's point over at Morgan Stanley, that essentially what happens with equities right now really does hinge on just the health of the labor market. Don't forget, some of these lesser indicators are actually very important. We get jolts tomorrow. Sure. We get ADP, jobless claims, like you were mentioning. How much do people take the idea of just a less good environment as being more negative than it is positive because it will be met with outsized Fed rate cuts? This, to me, is the ultimate question. Is this the week where the pivot point of negative data is very negative for equity markets that are basically hinged on the economy growing faster than people are currently pricing it? Are we looking for a hint of Goolsby a little bit later this afternoon? If we get a hint of Goolsby, how much do equities rally? I think this market goes up and to the right pretty quickly if you get a hint of Goolsby. Equity futures right now down and to the right. We're negative by about two tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. Yields are higher by two basis points, the 10 year 377. Coming up this hour, Vinu Krishna of Barclays on Beijing's stimulus boost. We'll speak to Sheila Kaolu of Jeffries as Boeing labor talks remain stored. And Aditya Bhave of Bank of America Securities previewing the payrolls report. We begin this hour looking ahead to remarks from Fed Chair Jay Powell this afternoon and Friday's jobs report after stimulus from China boosted sentiment worldwide, helping to send Chinese stocks into a bull market but Vinu Krishna of Barclays is staying cautious, saying we would note that despite upbeat sentiment in financial markets, our macro research colleagues believe that impacts to China's real economy are likely to be limited. Vinu joins us now for more. Vinu, it's good to see you. Good to see you. Are you not buying the happy talk out of China in the last week? I think in the short term, all these measures could work, uh, given how negative the positioning has been in the sentiment. Uh, But I think the issue with China is uh, much bigger. It's structural, uh, demographics, uh, the property market, uh, consumer sentiment, 
uh, a host of things, uh, domestic consumption, right, which is uh, you can't export your way out forever, which is what they're trying even now. So uh, I think that is the question. So I think in the short term, it's tough because uh, the question of what, is it a gun or is it a bazooka sure. or whatever, right? So uh, you, you find, you bring your bazooka and death. But structurally, over the longer term, what changes? How right? would you describe the move over the last week? Is that just shorts coming off, new longs going gone, a positioning squeeze that turns into a bit of a mount up in the short term? What would you call this? I would say it's a combination. It's a big relief as well, because so far, the concern has been that in the past, they've, you know, they've thrown in a huge amount of stimulus. They weren't doing it this time. And so the concern was that they don't care as much. But now uh, the opinion is that they do care. And, and now they're saying that uh, this is very important uh, and they're going to do something about it, right? So I think it's a combination of all those. Uh, and perhaps it has some uh, staying power. But I, I take a step back and say, just like the U.S. economy, the reason you're optimistic is structurally there are a lot of things different in the U.S. It's not the same uh, in, in China. So when you put all those facts together, um, I think it's a wait and see. So you said that there are some structural things in the U.S. that are good. So you're bullish on the U.S. Yes, I'm still bullish on the U.S., though uh, I'm a little concerned at the pace at which we are going ahead. Uh, I think it looks too fast too soon. But structurally, for example, you know, I mean, the U.S. Uh, remains at the forefront of the technology front, uh, unparalleled. Uh, we, uh, you know, are still, uh, you know, the, the world's biggest economy, right? We are the world's biggest uh, oil producer now. Uh, and we still are at the center of probably the leader of the global financial architecture. And the dollar still remains a reserve currency, unlikely to change. So I think when you start putting all that together, mainly I would say even tech, because the secular shift in the markets right now is around technology. And the shift in technology, if you take a step back, is not something which is new. It's been going on for about three to four decades now, from the PC cycle to the internet, to mobile devices. We were in the middle of a cloud transition, and then you got AI on top of that. And at the center of it is the action is coming from the US. And the ecosystem we have in the US, mainly around the valley, is unparalleled and cannot be replicated just by infusing capital. That's a great story. Yeah. You expect losses by the year end. How much short term do you expect this story to have been overplayed and basically uh, everything to really face a whole lot of volatility based on potential growth headwinds, potential regulation, potential geopolitics, the election? Absolutely. You raise a lot of right points. And that's why, if you see, my base case price target is 5,600. We're already above that. But we do have an upside case of 6,100. And in all fairness, a downside case of close to 5,000. So I think the way to think about it is big tech has corrected reasonably healthily. Uh, multiples which had gone to about 34 times are now back to about 29 times. So just about the threshold where we feel comfortable. Uh, I think anything in the mid-20s to 29 in the range is reasonable because uh, their growth is decelerating. So they are comping the comp. In other words, now they, have to, they are looking at 60% plus growth rate to, to sort of match against in the coming quarters. And the expectation is that their growth will decelerate to around the 20% range. So pretty healthy. You're paying a peg ratio of 1.3, 1.4, which is quite full, uh, but it's not broken. But for the rest of S&P, the comps get easier. So you had bad numbers, now the street expectation is it goes up 15, 16%. I'm skeptical, I think it's going to be less than that. But still, directionally what's happened is the composition of growth has changed. So big tech still leading, but moderating, reasonably priced. Uh, and the rest of the S&P quite fully valued, I would argue, uh, but growing at, you know, expected to grow in my view, maybe around 10-ish percent, which is not a bad combination. It leaves me to your question, um, that what about the levels right now? I think we probably need to take a little bit of a breather. And I don't know what the catalyst is going to be. Maybe it's elections, uh, maybe it's some geopolitical event, but we haven't cared about geopolitics forever. So I'm not too sure why we'll start caring now. You have such a big gap when it comes to the upside and the downside. Yeah. Um, and you say, yeah, you don't know the catalyst for what yeah. could be. Is sure. there a potential of what the catalyst, though, would be to the upside if you're unclear about what it would be in terms of taking a breather. Sure, I think the catalysts are very clear. You talked about the jobs numbers just now. So the big shift in sentiment over the last, call it, 
month or two months has been this growth scare, right? And so based on historical experiences, the market is very concerned, and we are, that is the labor market as robust as it seems? You know, is it a fact that labor market can decelerate very quickly? We don't know, we don't think so. But the point is, it is very clear that the odds of even a shallow recession have increased over the last two months, they haven't decreased, right? So that is your, that is your case, downside case. If you start suddenly seeing a deterioration in the labor market, which nobody is expecting, including us, uh, but it is a real possibility because the odds have increased, um, you could start testing the downside. On the other hand, we are still printing very robust numbers. You saw the Atlanta GDP number, it came even stronger. Consumer sentiment marginally increasing. So I think if growth does accelerate, and there's a reasonable likelihood, even though that's come down a little bit, there you have my upside case of 6,100. So I think, you know, it all depends, and the derivatives market is telling you that the one thing they care about is the NFPs, right? So, um, you know, that, that's where the action is. So good news is good news still. That doesn't change. Yes. Right now, the good news is good news. Uh, we have shifted from uh, that, that paradox of flipping it back. Um, but I think the, the question is good news is good news still something breaks, right? And so the disconnect right now is between the rates market and the equity market, right? And what I would suggest is that the rates market has been all over the map for the last two years. We we're expecting seven cuts, then zero, now, you know, nine cuts by the end of middle year, middle of next year. So the equity market has been more right than wrong, right? And so that's an interesting situation we are in, right? You throwing some shade at your colleagues on the other side of the room, <laughs> that the bond market's been all over the place. Did you hear that? I heard that. I heard that. So, you know, basically, is that your, your accusation? <laughs> Well, my point is that everybody looks at the rates market as a big barometer of what to expect. <laughs> Smart money in right? the room, yeah. So, which is true, but my point is but if you tried to follow that, you'd have gone crazy because you wouldn't know what to do a week from week, right? Okay. It's flipping. All right, hold on a second. In fairness, yeah. so not to defend the bond yeah. market, but to defend the bond market, <laughs> equities have had, S&P 500 has had five straight months of gains if we close out the month of September sure. with a gain. It has come in tandem with two-year yields having five straight months of yields going down. You're saying that that isn't directly correlated? Well, what you really care about for equities is the 10-year rates, right? And if you look at 10-year rates, where are they moving around? Well, that is a discount factor because we're a long-duration asset, right? And we were hovering around 5% a few months ago, right? And then we went to 3.5%. Now you're again going back towards the 4% range. So I'm not trying to sort of reduce the importance of the rate. It is very, very important because it is discount rate that factors in. He's trying but, to bring back his bond market colleagues. Uh, Carry on, come on, keep going. But at the end of the day, but, you know, uh, it's been all over the map. And, and <laughs> let me tell you something. Please so do. everybody, everybody in the macro market is concerned about deficits, right? So you would expect that shows up in the term premium. Where is it? Some big egos on that side of the room, as you know. Vinu, thank you. <laughs> Vinu Krishna Welcome. of Barclays. They would say justifiably so. Well, yeah, they would say, look, the bond market has lost some of its preeminence when it comes to predictive power. You worry about the deficit. You whine about the deficit. Why aren't you responding with higher yields? It's something a lot of people have mentioned. Just wait. That's what Brian Weinstein says. Your yields are up today. You're 10 years up by two. <laughs> You're two years up by close to five. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning with your Bloomberg brief. Here's Yahara Hackers. Hey, Yahara. Hi, John. We start with those devastating floodwaters threatening more damage in Georgia and South Carolina in the aftermath of Hurricane Helene. The Category 4 storm that came ashore Friday killed at least 84 people and left millions without power. AccuWeather estimates the storm may be one of the costliest in U.S. history, with damages, damages totaling anywhere from $95 billion to $110 billion. Meanwhile, vice presidential candidates Tim Walls and J.D. Vance will take the spotlight tomorrow night in a debate on CBS. They will stand behind two behind podiums in front of two moderators, but with no studio audience. Vance has been prepping with Republican Congressman Tom Emmer of Minnesota, while Transportation Secretary and one-time presidential hopeful himself, Pete Buttigieg, has been holding mock debates with Walls as part of his preparations. And Ford is increasing its efforts to boost electrical vehicle sales. Starting tomorrow, the automaker will offer free home chargers and cover the cost of installation 
for customers who purchase the TVs. The promotion will be available for the Mustang Mach-E, the F-150 Lightning pickup truck, and the E-Transit cargo van. The deal aims to ease range anxiety felt by many mainstream buyers. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? It's a tough, super competitive market for the likes of Ford and others as well. This just dropped from Peter Cheer over at Academy, and it speaks to what we've been talking about through the last few hours on this program. This time, the benefits from Chinese stimulus would accrue much more to China and its companies than to the US and its companies. This does not lift all boats. There's been a real preference shift from the Chinese consumer to domestic brands. How much is the knee-jerk reaction by investors that a rising China will lift all boats globally? And how much is that incorrect based on some of the structural shifts over the past few years? And I think that that is what Peter Scheer is trying to get at. Check out European equities this morning. Tough. Stellantis get an absolutely hammered cut its outlook. VW cuts its outlook for a second time in three months. Up next on the program, the Morning Calls Plus, Sheila Kaolu of Jefferies as Boeing labor talks remain at a standstill. That's next. This is Bloomberg. The opening bound one hour and about 13 minutes away. Equity futures pulling back by two tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. Let's get you some morning calls. First up, Barclays, Dan Grenning, Procter & Gamble to equal weight, expecting slower growth due to weakening sales in China. Next up, Morgan Stanley, Dan Grenning, JP Morgan to equal weight, saying the bank is among the worst positioned for rate cuts. Their stock is down by 1% in the pre-market. Those earnings just a few Fridays away. And finally, TD Coward raising its price target on Southwest to 25, citing ambitious 20 27 targets announced during Investor Day. Stay tuned for more on that. That stock is up by two tenths of 1%. Sticking with travel, the Boeing strike continuing into the third week. Sheila Kolu of Jefferies recently cutting her price target on the plane maker to 240 from 270, but maintaining a buy rating, expecting an early October end to the strike and resetting expectations for a smoother ramp through 2026. Sheila joins us now for more with the stock down another 1%. Sheila, good morning to you. Morning. Why the price target cut first and why the base case still to get a resolution to this, resolution to this in early October? Early October means about a month. Uh, so we're 18 days in. So we would expect some sort of resolution uh, in the next week and a half or so. Uh, the reason for that is they've missed one paycheck last Thursday. I think you start feeling it when you miss the second paycheck. Uh, remember, the, the workers on strike are not earning anything at all. They get about a $150 gift card starting this week in week three. So um, we'll see. They're, they're sticking to it, though, and we're seeing strikes elsewhere, obviously, as well. They're asking for what and what's being offered? So we don't know what they're asking for, but they're getting a 30 percent pay raise. Uh, they want some pension benefits in there. Uh, they have the bonus back end, which was a sticking point in the original offer. Um, so they want... You know, we, we, we're not we're unsure, unclear as to what what the IAM is focused on in terms of the increase, but they want more than 30 percent over the next few years. We've been struggling to understand oh, whether this is the last gasp of labor having leverage or whether this is actually an ongoing kind of theme that we're seeing with respect to leverage, given what we're seeing also with the ports. What's your sense with why now and how much momentum is behind these particular strikes? I think why now is a lot of the labor force might have changed its demographics since the pandemic. You might have a younger workforce that isn't as attuned to its employee base, uh, you know, employer. And maybe that's why. I mean, with Textron in Wichita, we're seeing a strike, same IAM uh, machinist union group. We're seeing that they put out a very decent offer for the first proposal that they had. They had everything the group wanted, and it was an 84 percent vote down. So we're seeing that across, you know, aerospace and obviously the ports as well. And it could just be the momentum, but I think at some point reality hits when you don't have that first month of pay, the second month of pay, I mean, it has to hurt. At a certain point, the bull case for Boeing has to be that the U.S. can't let it fail. That basically this is not a company that is optional for the United States. Uh, what's your sort of thesis behind having a lower price target, but also a buy rating? You know, the, in terms of the strike, I think the case is after six weeks, it becomes a mute point because even if you get a 40 percent raise, which is the highest we've seen in the sector, and that's Air Canada, which you could say is arguably in Canada. So it's a little bit of different employer base. Um, 
it becomes a moot point because you lose six weeks of pay. And even if you get a 40% increase, you're breaking even over that time period. Of course, you have a higher base to go off of. But, you know, I, I find it hard to strike post that six week mark, six and a half week mark. Um, we cut our estimates by 15%, and it was solely based on production coming in lower. We're expecting about 400 aircraft this year, 600 deliveries next year. That's across their entire group, so 737s, maxes. Um, and that we're not including 1.3 billion of free cash flow usage in our base case assumptions of 240 yet per month for the strike, as well as any sort of equity raise, which we think is certainly on the table. Given how important Boeing is to the U.S. industrial base, likely why you have this buy rating still in the company, do you expect the U.S. government to get more involved if the talks drag on more than a month? Yeah, the buy rating is solely based on execution of the backlog, and we continue to push out our numbers, whether it's 25, 26, 27, getting that free cash flow base case management's working actively. It doesn't seem like the government is, you know, is intervening in any sort of way, aside from a federal mediator that's that's about as aggressive as, as it's gotten. We've heard no mention from the administration in terms of Boeing, where Trump was, a Trump administration was much more involved and heavy handed. But this company is still too important to fail. Of course. I mean, we don't have deliveries of aircraft. It impacts schedules. It impacts the aftermarket. And that's really been our main call has been long after market names. We just put out a very bullish note on this company called Eptai, GE, Heiko, Transdime. Every 100 planes that aren't delivered is 5% upside to the aftermarket names at minimum. And so you keep those planes sitting there for longer. You extend the life of these existing aircraft, and it's very it's a bullish sign for those older planes and who's servicing those. This is Boeing. Can we talk about Southwest? Of course. I mentioned that call from TD Cowan. They've raised their price target. They're citing ambitious 2027 targets around Investor Day. You've still got to sell on this name. They call it ambitious. What do you call it? Yeah, we, we you know, it's a very non-consensus call to have a sell rating on Southwest. I just can't bridge the $4 billion of incremental you know, EBITDA, but this stock is not going to trade on near-term num numbers over the short term. That's very clear. Because uh, if it was, it'd be much higher than that. I mean, I think, you know, the companies break even this year. To get an incremental $4 billion in 2027 is robust by any company, let alone an airline, which is extremely volatile. You've got your doubts. How premium, how big is this push into premium right now? It's interesting. Their premium is extra legroom, uh, essentially three inches. I mean, at five feet, three inches does absolutely nothing for me. But for some, they might pay a 70% premium on the air airfare, which is what Southwest didn't give us that 70%, but that's essentially what it's embedding to hit their $4 billion incremental EBIT target, is that they're going to get essentially 2x the fare for three inches of extra legroom versus the existing seat. I mean, I find that hard to believe, but maybe it's all the Boeing workers that are striking that are gonna pay that. I'm not, I'm unclear as to who's it's, willing. It's like glamping, but I just wonder how much this is just uh, is a, essentially an oversaturated market, especially if you're trying to make incremental changes that include, you know, breathing space and maybe having your bags with you. I mean, the best part about Southwest's interior when we got to sit in it last week was the fact that they have power plugs. Southwest did not have power plugs, so as a corporate customer, they totally missed out on that customer base. I mean, they were behind the curve, let's face it. So this retrofit, by the way, they're expecting to do all 700 aircraft in the next 12 months. I mean, that is, given the tightness and the aftermarket and the maintenance shops that we're seeing, I find that hard to believe. But kudos to them for laying out a strategy. I'll buy some of that $4 billion, but definitely not the 100% and maybe not even 50% there. Sheila, appreciate it. Thank There's you. your view on Southwest. Kind of brutal, I've got to say. Sheila Coley there of Jefferies. This is a very crowded push into the premium space. Yeah, and how premium is premium? I mean, it sort of well, raises this question, right? Is it point. three inches? Is it that you actually get a drink? Is it that you get to carry a carry-on? I mean, it's a sort of like outlet. basic power <laughs> outlet. You basically take enough things away and then you can add them back for a charge, which has essentially been the model of modern airplanes. How basic, a power outlet. You know, I agree. I agree. There's still some planes that don't have power outlets. Well, I just wonder, you know, there's this pitch toward people who are going on vacation. It's sort of the girls trip out and you want to add, you know, some niceties. But there's a question about whether those niceties are three inches of leg room versus, you know. Nicety, power outage is basic. Power <laughs> Well, you know, some of us can't always fly in the jet stream like Anne Marie. Is she flying in the Gulf Stream? Yeah, she's, she's, Gulf she's stream. doing. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. Good for you. Only on the weekends.
Coming up next on the programme, Aditya Bhave of Bank of America Securities and Cathy Jones of Charles Schwab counting you down to an address from Chairman Powell later on this afternoon and payrolls on Friday. The opening bell one hour away, equity futures negative, two tenths of one percent. Sixty minutes out from the opening bell. Here are the scores for you. The price action looks like this: equity futures negative across the board here on the S&P 500 near session lows. We're down a quarter of one percent on the Nasdaq 100. We're down around about a third. One hour away from the cash open. Let's get you some morning movers. We can do that with Manus Cranny. Morning, Manus. Jonathan, a very good morning to you. Stellantis. What do they own in America? Why are we starting with that? Down 13 percent. Dodge, Jeep, Ram, and Chrysler. This company is going from cash flow positive to cash flow negative of nearly six billion dollars. They're lowering production and they're going to use more incentives. Now the issue is this, clear the inventory off our lots. That is the message from the US uh, sellers here. They wrote an open letter to the CEO. You're degradating our brands here in the United States of America. You're on course for disaster in the US. Now this bleeds through to GM, have a look, roll it over. VW warned this morning as well. They're hemorrhaging market share. You got it, BYD, electric vehicles in China. GM had that downgrade last week, we talked about it. Morgan Stanley downgrading it to underweight. Again, the bleed through from Stellantis across the auto sector here in the United States of America this morning. Uh, That ever important growth of EV in China and everybody else pretty much bungling it. Nvidia. Down again this morning, day two. We're looking at a near 5% drop in this stock price over the trading of two days. Why? A message from China. Do not put yourself, expose yourself to NVIDIA's H20 chips. The first half of this year, NVIDIA's exposure to China was six billion bucks. That's 11% of their income. I couldn't squeeze in Aston Martin. Stock is down 25%. Maybe the second-hand market will give me my DB7. Jonathan. Cross my fingers for you, Manus. That stock looks ugly. We're down and down hard for Aston Martin. Let's talk about the automakers. We've said this repeatedly on this program. This is probably the most competitive market on the planet anywhere. Chinese autos. These companies are working tremendously hard just to stand still in China and not go backwards. We're talking about a bigger pie off the back of some stimulus in China. We need to talk about a smaller and smaller slice going to international players outside of China. Which is what Peter Scheer was talking about from Academy Securities, that essentially this is a new China on some levels with domestic consumption being prioritized over international imports. So you start to wonder, even if there is that boost, what will it do to the Stellantis of the world, even the BMWs of the world that rely on Chinese exports, but at the same time are finding it very difficult to compete with some of the national champions. BMW, Mercedes last week up something like 8%. This morning, just a reality check across Europe. Stellantis, VW, Aston Martin. Just a brutal morning for European autos. And it raises this question. How much can they continue to lean into their China presence uh, versus at the expense of some higher walls to Chinese vehicles coming into Europe? Because that has been one of the biggest toggles that they've had to really face off with. How do they do that at a time where they already are underwater and need to find levers to pull to try to gain profitability? European stocks not participating in that big run up on the CSI 300 over in China today. The CSI 300 up by more than 8%. And equity futures aren't participating either. We're down by two tenths of 1% on the S&P. Markets looking ahead to the week's biggest catalyst, including today's remarks from Fed Chair Jay Powell. Ahead of September payrolls on Friday, Aditya Bave of Bank of America Securities expecting a print of 150,000 with unemployment holding steady at 4.2 percent. Aditya is with us in the studio here in New York. Aditya, good morning to you, sir. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. We've heard from consumers. They say jobs aren't as plentiful. They're getting harder to get. Are we going to see that in job openings this week? It's certainly a possibility. So if you look at the JOLTS report, this will, of course, be for August rather than September. But if you look at the recent JOLTS data, that job openings number has been dropping like a stone. And that's not sustainable. At some point, that's not going to be benign, right? It's going to start affecting the labor market. So that's something we're watching uh, quite carefully. The openings rate now looks quite consistent with where it was before the pandemic. So further sharp decreases in openings will be a point of concern. There's a missing feature in the bearish narrative. It's layoffs. What's happening with layoffs? Where are we? Layoffs are still very low. And that's the reason that we're holding on to our soft landing outlook. If you look at the layoff rate, 
that's been low. If you look at jobless claims, that's been low as well. And even within the unemployment data, you can look at kind of voluntary versus involuntary unemployment, where involuntary would be layoffs, right? So that only accounts for a little more than half of the increase in the unemployment rate. So no matter how you slice it, layoffs have been low, and that gives us more confidence about a soft landing. Also revisions, and this revisions. is sort of counterintuitive, yeah. because some people are saying the revisions to uh, jobless claims and to the jobs figures have been downward, and significantly yeah. so. But the revisions to GDP and GDI were the opposite direction and suggested quite a bit more growth in the couple of years in the direct aftermath of the pandemic. How much are you looking at that and saying, we need to rethink the strength of the economy? Oh, absolutely. Those revisions were remarkable. So there was a big gap between GDP and GDI going into the revisions, with GDI being significantly softer. So the bearish view on that was that eventually GDP would get revised to GDI because income is more easily measured or something like that. But actually what happened was that GDP got revised up, GDI got revised up even more, and it's now basically caught up to GDP. So across the board, you look at the components of income and compensation, for example, got revised up a lot. You look at the components of GDP, consumer spending, capex got revised up. So these were very positive revisions. And I think there's two potential Im implications, right? The first one is that productivity growth has really picked up more than we expected. The other is, look, there's this, eventually there's going to be a relationship between activity and the labor market. And which way will it go? Will activity backstop the labor market, which is now looking like a bigger risk uh, given, given the, the, the revisions? Or will activity collapse under the weight of a softening labor market, and now that's looking less likely. Okay, so this to me brings me to sort of the uh, paradox that we're dealing with right now in markets, which is you've got two tail risks that are diametrically opposed. Brian Weinstein earlier this morning really highlighted that, and he said people are underestimating the growth in this economy and, under, and are overestimating how low the neutral rate is. It actually is going to be much higher than the Fed says, and that really they don't have as long of a way to get to neutral. Do you agree, based on some of these revisions and the amount of momentum that there seemed to be in the economy heading out of the uh, pandemic? Sure. So to the extent that productivity growth has really picked up, very mechanically, that does mean a higher neutral rate. I think eventually we'll know the neutral rate when we get there. So That's we're not probably good enough. not. Come on. Give us advance notice. <laughs> It's, it's probably higher than it was before the pandemic. Uh, Chair Powell said that as well. The question is, is it high twos? Before the pandemic, it was low twos, right? So is it high twos, is it mid threes, or is it even closer to 4%? And I think all we can honestly say about uh, the neutral rate is that it's somewhere between two and a half and four, and we'll, we'll know when we get there. Aditya, can we ask about what's potentially going to happen in the next few hours? We know what's going to happen. There's going to be strikes at ports. What could be the impact on the economy? So there's two things that we focus on when we think about the impact of strikes on economic activity. The first one is that the longer they last, the more of a drag they are, but not in a linear sense, but rather in a non-linear sense at some point, because then they start to affect supply chains, right? So a one or two week strike is pretty painless, right? The other thing is that because GDP is a flow variable, whatever impact they have usually gets paid back the following quarter when the strikes end. So it'll be a temporary impact. It'll show up. It won't show up in claims because when you're striking, you can't apply for jobless claims, but it will show up in employment. So what's the cutoff when it actually can become more damaging down the line? It really depends on how many people are striking, how broad the strikes are. So there's no fixed sort of cut off, right? Uh, but, but when we were thinking about the auto strikes last year, for example, we were thinking, you know, once you go beyond four to six weeks, it gets a lot more painful. So how much do I need to strip out from Friday's number? Do I need to strike adjust this number? Not really, no, because the survey period was the week of September 12th. Do I need to cut off 60 because of revisions? You need to account for the fact that Chair Powell is cutting off something, right? He didn't say what, maybe it's 40 to 60. But this I thought was really interesting in, in his press conference. What he said was, we are mentally adjusting down the jobs data that, that we get, right? So there was a question about whether the downward revisions from the QCW, which ended as of this March, would extend to April and beyond. And he's saying that the Fed is working on the assumptions that they will, which is quite dovish, right? Because if you're trending around 120, 130, you could easily just idiosyncratically get a soft number around 60, 70, 80. And then you know Powell's thinking of that as being very close to zero. 
So that actually makes a pretty strong case for another 50 from our perspective. So just I'm going to take a line from markets philosopher Jonathan Farrow, who is talking about the whiff of Goolsby. If we hear the whiff of Goolsby at 1.55 p.m. today from Jerome Powell, how much does that risk a reacceleration in the market with a series of 50 basis point rate cuts that reignite the growth side of the equation? It's a risk. The question is how many 50s can, can Powell pull off, right? So if you look at the dot plot and you take it at face value, which I would recommend you don't do, but if you did, then you know, it would say that they're not going to do any more 50s, right? We think they'll do one more, but each one that Powell pushes through, we now have a strong sense that he's more dovish than the rest of the committee, it's gonna be harder. They're going to face more resistance, because each one you do, you're telling the markets that, that, that we're not going to stop, and you're getting closer to neutral, so maybe you don't want to do too many. So our base case is one more, 50, and then back to 25s, but honestly, everything's on the table for this Fed. You could get to 25s if the jobs data are good. You could get very, very fast cuts if the jobs data deteriorate further. What are you focused on this afternoon? Just a final question. What are you looking for from the Federal Reserve Chair? I think he's going to be pretty non-committal. There's two more jobs reports before the next meeting. He really, really wants to keep his options open. So it's going to be data dependence. You know, we, he probably used the word recalibration again, which again for us, if, if you're recalibrating, why only do that one extra 25 basis point increment, right? You want to do at least one more. But, but he's probably going to talk about recalibration and he's going to mix this very optimistic message about the economy with a more dovish message around, you know, we'll do what it takes to, to accommodate the labor market. Two payrolls report, I think one CPI report and a presidential election in between uh, the That's next true. decision. Yeah, it's <laughs> going to be really tricky. Uh, you got to imagine that if he lays the groundwork now for we're going to dove, that will just, you know, take away a lot of the uncertainty and the potential I Imagine if he actually spoke thing. like that. We're going to dove. <laughs> Aditya, it's good to see you. Aditya Bhave <laughs> of Bank of America. That would change things up a bit. Kathy Jones joins us now from Charles Schwab. Kathy, your call has been, not for him saying that, but for lower <laughs> yields in the bond market. Kathy, are you still committed to that call that yields can edge lower from here? Well, I think they edge lower. I think much of the move has already taken place, particularly you know, as further out the curve you go. So we're looking for a bull steepening that is, you know, yields moving lower, but much more at the short end than intermediate or long term. We had a 375, 380 target for the 10 year. We're here. We're just sort of churning around. So we need to see a catalyst uh, for yields to move significantly lower from here. Kathy, how strong do you think the case is for higher yields, given what China started to talk about in the past week? Yeah, I don't I, I don't really put much stock in that. I think that we have um, a, a high bar for much higher yields. Uh, I think you'd need much more inflation activity to think about. You'd need a, a significant um, shift on the, in the FX market to show significantly weaker dollar. Um, I'm really not putting a lot of stock in that. We hear a lot of noise about it, but it, it never really materializes. I have to say, uh, Kathy, there were shots fired by Vinu Krishna earlier this morning when he was saying basically the bond market, you can't pay attention to them because they're all over the place. And they say they're worried about the deficit, but they never actually do anything about it with respect to demanding higher yields. And they say that you could potentially have the risk of higher growth Growth, but guess what? They bounced all over the place. Do you think that he's right? Well, it's been a volatile year. Uh, there have been a lot of shifts in the market. Um, I would argue the bond market really doesn't care about the deficit. Um, it certainly doesn't display any concern about the deficit. And yeah, you don't you don't see a big term premium in there. And we, we really haven't in the past because uh, the deficits haven't mattered. Now, maybe someday they will, but they haven't mattered for the U.S. So um, I, I think the problem in the bond market is we've had a lot of mixed economic data. We've had um, a Fed that was data dependent and therefore not giving, you know, huge forward guidance to go off of. You know, forward guidance is great when you're cutting to zero and there's a crisis. It's very clear. Forward guidance doesn't really help you when the economy is just kind of rolling along, which is where we are. So um, I would say he's partially right that the bond market has been all over the place. But I don't know that it's an irrational all over the place. It's just reflecting the data as they come in.
There is a feeling, and this might be the anxiety underpinning some of the uh, recent jiggles that we've seen in longer term yields, and actually something that you reflected in your recent notes, that there is this risk case for higher yields on the long end than even you expect based on tariffs and immigration. What about accelerating growth or the prospect that we might not have uh, as far to go to get to neutral, as Chair Powell is saying? Yeah, I, you know, everybody talks about the neutral rate. No one's ever seen it. So I, I think you have to take all of that with a grain of salt. It'll move all over the place um, depending on the economic circumstances. But I think the risk to the upside from um, imposing, say, big tariffs, uh, which gives us a one-time increase in inflation, uh, and probably weakens confidence in the U.S. in terms of policy, that would be that would be a concern. Um, it may have a counter effect of actually slowing the economy at the same time. So it could be quite a bit of volatility uh, associated with that. And I, I do think one reason longer yields are not really moving very much is partly the economy is doing fine and there's no reason for them to crater. But also, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty about policy. You know, when we get back in January, maybe we'll know some more when we know the, the composition of Congress. But there's a huge amount of questions about where we're going in terms of policy. At 1.55 this afternoon, the Federal Reserve Chair, as you know, Kathy, is speaking at a conference in Nashville. There is a Q&A, as Lisa indicated a little bit earlier this morning. Kathy, are there any blind spots left? We've heard from so many Fed officials in the last week. What's left to discuss? <laughs> yeah, it's hard to imagine he's going to tread any new ground uh, in this speech. I think he'll probably be very clear that things are going well. We do have a great soft landing scenario right now. Um, he'll probably warn about some of the risks ahead and say that the Fed's attentive to those. So I don't think he's going to go off off um, you know the road here in terms of what the exit strategy might be. Are you going to speed up and take the fast lane? Are you going to slow down from here? I think it's going to be more of the same because why argue with, with things when they're going well? It seems like uh, people aren't really expecting much from this week. I heard from Brian Weinstein earlier who said it's going to be boring. We're going to trade in a range until we break out. And we could break out to 550 and we could break down the downside at 325. How much do you expect something to change with NF NFP, non-farm payrolls, on Friday, given the fact that if you get a more negative print, you could start pricing in a very different outcome for both the Fed and for this fictitious thing that no one's ever seen, the neutral rate? Yeah, well, we are looking for something on the lower end of, of the range, the consensus range. And I think that is a reflection of the fact that we've had those downward revisions, um, significant downward revisions, which, you know, they tend to move with the trend and the trend is slower. So I don't think that 110, 115 is out of the question. It's below consensus. It's not a disaster, but it's below. And I think that that could break us out of a range. Uh, obviously, if we got, you know, 160, 170, 180, something like that, um, that would uh, send yields uh, back up to the close to the 4% area, probably on the uh, 10 year. But I, I don't think we're probably going to see anything too dramatic, probably weaker rather than stronger, which is why our bias is still towards lower yields, just not at the pace that we've seen over the last six months or so. Kathy, appreciate the view, as always. Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab. Kathy, good luck for the trading week. 145 is the estimate in our survey. As the DJ Bave of Bank of America said just moments ago, I think we're all just sort of mentally adjusting those numbers lower as they come in. I know exactly what you would ask if you had the chance to Chairman Powell later on this afternoon. Investors putting too much weight on articles coming out in the quiet period and whether that complicates your effort to communicate. Is this the new communication strategy that basically there are certain people when you read an article that's basically Jay Powell ghostwriting it? And is this something that basically is prescriptive for markets or do you not like that? The unofficial 13th member of the FOMC. I think it's a problem. We both think it's a problem. I think that it changes the narrative for a lot of people. It changes the calculus for what people look to in the quiet period to get some guidance for a Federal Reserve that doesn't shy away from surprises, which is what we just saw. So if you're at that conference, sort of stick your hand up and, you know, try and get a microphone. Oh. And 
ask a question a little bit later on this afternoon. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Yahira Hacker. Say Yahira. Hi, John. California Governor Gavin Newsom has vetoed what would have become one of the most comprehensive policies governing the safety of AI in the U.S. The bill to hold AI developers accountable for harm caused by their products drew fierce criticism from some major tech firms who warned it could stall innovation. Newsom says he will consult with experts to develop workable guardrails. Meanwhile, SpaceX has started its mission to bring home two astronauts stuck in orbit after technical failures with Boeing's Starliner capsule. SpaceX's Dragon Crew-9 has docked with the International Space Station carrying an American astronaut and a Russian cosmonaut. The spacecraft had two empty seats reserved for NASA astronauts Barry Wilmore and Sunita Williams, who will fill them when they all return to Earth in February. And today is the final day of baseball's regular season with three teams now in the race for two National League wildcard spots. The New York Mets and Atlanta Braves will play a doubleheader after last week's games were postponed due to Hurricane Helene. If the Mets and Braves split today's twin bill, both will make the postseason. If either team loses both games, they would be eliminated and the Arizona Diamondbacks would get the final spot. First pitch for game one of the Mets versus Braves is at 1.10 p.m. Eastern. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahara, thank you. Thanks for this morning. Game of the weekend, Alabama, Georgia. Just absolutely, did you watch that? Saturday I did evening? not, absolutely but I heard that amazing. it was pretty incredible. Crimson Tide throw away a 28 point lead. Looks like they're going to choke. Then this 17 year old, Ryan Williams, who's a total beast. I mean, I have no, how's this guy 17? I have no idea. Hold on a second. You put Jonathan Farrow in the United States for enough years, and he stops talking about football, the British kind. He starts talking about football, the U.S. college kind. I've got Who this? College football and the atmosphere around it is the closest thing that we have here to European football. Okay, is that your take? That's that my you, take. So you'll watch college football, but Very not Very particular football. games, SEC football, Alabama, Georgia. I think that's as close as you can come <laughs> to some kind of like European type rivalry and international football. Welcome, that's Thank all you. I could say. Thank you for having me. I'm next on the program, setting you up for the week ahead. You're watching Bloomberg Surveillance. And scene. <laughs> Both of them pour freezing cold water over Saturday night's game. And what do they do in the commercial break? They watch the highlights of the last two minutes and they're like, oh, wow. Yeah, welcome. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm busy. I can't, I can't respond. This is really good. What a game. Counting you down to the oven and bow this morning. 47, 40 minutes away, something like that. Here's the trading diary for the day and a week ahead. Remarks from Fed Chair Jay Powell coming out at about 2 p.m. Eastern time. Tuesday, we'll get Jolts and ISM Manufacturing and Nike earnings after the closing bow. Plus, the first vice presidential debate at 9 p.m. Eastern time. On Wednesday, ADP private payrolls. Thursday, another round of jobless claims. And on Friday, the main event. It's Payrolls Friday. Bloomberg's Mike McKee is with us in the studio. Mike, good morning. Good morning. Nice to be here on Sports Center. Thank you and welcome. More of that still to come. Let's talk about the chairman of the Federal Reserve coming up a little bit later this afternoon. What's left to know? Uh, you're not going to get a whole lot. I think Aditya put it well when he said he's going to be very flexible because they have a lot of reports coming out between now and their next meeting on November 7th. So I would expect him to say the same things that he's been saying that the labor market and the inflation numbers are better balanced now and and we're going to focus on the employment side of this for the time being. But we think at this point uh, we're going to keep our options open because we don't know exactly we're going to be data dependent. So we were joking that maybe he'll come out and say we're going to dove. But there is this feeling that maybe he'll come out and say, you know, we're not going to moderate. We're not going to be moderate about we're this. We're not going to moderate. I like <laughs> we're not going to moderate. I'm basically, the invention of <laughs> verbs here. <laughs> There's, stop calling me out. This is kind of what we noticed from Jackson Hole. Is that what we're getting? Well, unless you have Mike, some... Mike, help her out here. <laughs> I don't think he'll hawk either. Uh, 
<laughs> unless you have some data that tells you that things are falling apart or things are getting really strong again, then you're not likely to see him do anything more than say we're data dependent and we'll make our decisions when we get there. We just had Mickey Bowman, the Fed governor who dissented at the last meeting. Uh, she's giving a speech now saying that she's still not convinced that they need to do 50 at the next meeting, that we are uncomfortably above the 2% target still, although she doesn't rule it out if the labor market weakens a little bit. Did you watch the game Saturday? Unfortunately, I did. You didn't I was on that. the wrong side. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a finish, wasn't it? It was quite a finish, and it was, as they say, an instant classic. An instant classic, one of the best. Mike, thank you, sir. Mike McKee on the Federal Reserve, a sprinkle of football, and looking ahead to Chairman Powell and Payrolls Friday. Coming up tomorrow, here's the lineup for you. Peter Chu of Academy Securities, look out for that. Lots of thoughts, very, very unique, original thoughts on what's taking place in China and what won't happen for certain parts of this equity market. We'll catch up with him. We'll also speak to Seema Shah of Principal Asset Management, Lindsay Rosner of Goldman Sachs, and Erin Brown of PIMCO. I'm hoping that Lisa might be able to speak. Stay tuned. I can speak. You're going to be all right? I'm going to be so good. Is he going to dove a little <laughs> bit later? Or is he going to hawk? <laughs> is he going to moderate? Stay tuned on Bloomberg TV and Bloomberg Radio for that and a whole lot more. From New York City, have a wonderful trading week. Good luck to all of you from New York. This was Bloomberg Surveillance.